podcast world what's up chat bell back at you with another exciting and i mean exciting episode of the podcast today this life ain't for everybody as always our episode today is brought to you by our friends lynchburg tennessee please enjoy it responsibly never allow underage drinking jack daniels the one and only one of the most iconic brands of all time in American history, in my opinion. And I think I have a man as my guest today that will agree with that. His story is awesome. I know a little bit about it and I'm going to learn a lot about it today. And we also have a cool surprise for you during this podcast today. We're actually going to talk whiskey and taste whiskey. And we're going to let you in on those details pretty soon. My guest today is the master distiller of Jack Daniels Whiskey, Lynchburg, Tennessee, Mr. Jeff Arnett. How are you, my man? I'm doing great. It's good to be with you today. Man, I'm glad you're here. And what an honor. I see you got your, uh, you got a rooster right behind you, a little pheasant hunting <laughs> going on. How's, uh, yeah. how's, how's life in Lynchburg? You know, it's good. Uh, you know, we're, we're not the most populated county. We're the second smallest of 95 that make up the state. Uh, so it's pretty easy to social distance when you only have a few hundred people in town and a few thousand in the entire county. But, you know, we have had the, the virus visit us a little bit. Uh, we have about 600 employees and three of them are currently active and three have, have had it and recovered from it. So, you know, we're monitoring it, doing our very best to protect our employees through this so that we can maintain production so that we don't create a you know, worldwide shortage of Jack Daniels since every drop is made here. Uh, we feel some responsibility uh, to try to, to maintain that as best we can. So, uh, but we've been, we've been pretty lucky, I'd say. Uh, and our employees are, are just wonderful people. Uh, you know, even if they're not scared of the virus, they're doing a good job of distancing and wearing masks and things that we're asking them to do just to protect the most vulnerable. And we're not allowing tours right now, which is a little bit of a bummer because from where I'm sitting, if I look out the window to my right here, um, I, in, a, in a typical year, I'll see 300,000 people walk past my window and they come from all over the world to visit here. Uh, you know, and to, to us, that's sort of an honor because you have to want to get to Lynchburg. It's not like it's near anything. Uh, you know, we're an hour and a half or so south of Nashville. Uh, if you're going down the interstate, you're going to drive at least 30 minutes out of your way to get to us. But for, you know, for so many people uh, who come, maybe come to America for the first time, they, they make Lynchburg a part of that plan. And it, what an honor that they want to come here and, and see the place where every drop is made. So it's, it's good. But yeah, we're, I think we're all just hopeful that we can get through this and get back to what I would call more of a normal, even if it's a new normal, uh, where we can allow tourism again. It's kind of amazing to me, Jeff, that you made a statement in that when you were just talking about every drop is made in that same factory right there in the headquarters of Jack Daniels in Lynchburg. You do see that a lot in in whether it's soft drinks or beer, different beverages to where they might be made at different you know facilities around this country or around European countries. Every bit of Jack Daniels, which arguably, in my, well, in my opinion, I, there is no argument, but I'm sure others would argue that is the most successful, most iconic you know, whiskey brand for sure. And one of the most iconic brands in American history. It's so, it's so amazing that it's done in that little tiny area where there's hundreds of people around, maybe thousands in the entire <laughs> County, but a hundred, yep. you know, a hundred people in that town, a couple hundred in that town are, is almost the entire town of Lynchburg employed by Jack Daniels. You know, if, if you look at who lives here, uh, many of them are retirees of Jack Daniels. Uh, uh, if they don't work at the distillery, uh, we have a byproduct. So we take the starches and sugars out of the grain uh, in the fermentation process and make alcohol out of that. And then what's left over is high in protein. So uh, we have these rolling grassy hills uh, all around us. It's largely, you know, agricultural rule. So uh, a lot of people have cattle. So they may, if they don't work at the distillery, they're, they're more apt to be a farmer uh, and raising cattle. But we have 650 uh, employees here that work in production and about two thirds of them, interestingly, are not first generation employees for us. They, they have a parent or grandparent who currently works here or did before them or aunts, uncles, cousins. So uh, I, we have uh, groups of people that get together just because they have maybe common backgrounds. And I had told them, I said, we really need to start a group that we call the Ewoks. And that would be the employees without kin. Uh, because that's so rare here that somebody works here and doesn't have another family member working here as well. Uh, but about a third, a third or so of our employees are, you know, are Ewoks, I call them. 
uh, where they they're the only ones in their family who've ever worked here. And you and you made a comment that there's the county is um, one of the smallest counties in the state of Tennessee. Mm-hmm. It's true that it's a dry county, right? Which makes it all that much more like wow, like the, one of the most iconic, famous liquor brands in the world is made in a dry county, meaning you can't buy alcohol in that county, correct? Well, there's different ways to be dry. And I would just tell you that over time, and I think society in general is, is more progressive when it comes to alcohol. So I would describe Lynchburg as being damp. You know, it's not wet or dry at this point, but uh, there are no bars or restaurants that are allowed to serve liquor by the drink here. So if you come and take the tour, uh, we can do a tasting and we have a bottle shop where you can purchase bottles at the end of the tour. Uh, but you can't walk onto the town square and go to a restaurant and order a Jack on the Rocks, a Jack and Coke. That's not allowed. Uh, our local beer board has made a decision here recently that they're allowing beer to be served on the square. So there, there is beverage alcohol. Uh, there's a small winery on our square. Uh, and if you make it, you can serve it. That's the way the laws read. Uh, so Lynchburg is not quite as dry, maybe as it once was. Over time, it's getting a little bit more damp. So, but yeah, but but officially, we still are considered a dry town because there's no liquor by the drink allowed in in the county. Wow, it's it's pretty interesting. So <laughs> you can't bring your own. There's no BYOB or BYO Jack on into no. a restaurant. You can't. Yeah. Can't no have brown it. bagging, no brown. Yeah. You know. So yeah. if you go to the drive-in, if there is one, you couldn't have a beer in the back of your truck watching a movie. Well, of course, we're such a small community here. Uh, there is a drive-in, but it's in the next county. It's in the next uh, county. So, yeah, and 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 pretty much if you drive ten or fifteen miles in any direction out of Lynchburg, you're going into a different county, and they're all wet. Uh, so, yeah, the, Lynchburg is sort of this one little microcosm of, of going back in time, you know, in so many regards, when you come and a lot of people who see our black and white ads uh, and they see pictures of the town, they think it's a movie set that must be like a prop that it wouldn't look that way if they actually visited. Then they get here and begin to realize that that really is the town. I mean, it's just a small town square uh, with an old historic courthouse. It's a great, it's a great place to visit. You know, I, there's uh, because there's not a lot of, you know, bar saloon type things on the square. It's very family friendly. If people are passing through on vacation, you can push strollers around town and, and people are very friendly here and uh, there's good food on the square. And um, of course there's the smell of mash in the air. You can't go anywhere in Lynchburg and you know, if the wind's blowing right, you're going to smell, you know, what the, what the hometown product is. It's pretty obvious. Uh, it's got a distinct aroma to it. All right. Well, educate me a little bit, Mr. Jeff Arnett. Who was Jack Daniels and how did this come about to the point to where I've talked with you a little bit in our life, 20, 30 minutes, and you made a comment in that conversation about the rec- the recognition of just the bottle without the label, the, the number seven, um, the probably the most probably the most famous bar drink in American history, I would say is up there is the Jack and Coke, if not by far Um, in today's world with college kids and stuff, there's probably some other ones out there, but in my 45 years on this earth, it's the Jack and Coke. I would say for sure. Um, Coca-Cola, another iconic brand. You actually see those paired together on signs and in branding Jack and Coke with both of the logos. So who was he and how, and give me a little bit of the rundown of how it happened to where the brand is where it's at, you know, over a hundred years later. Yep. And I'll, and I'm going to comment on that. You were talking about how iconic the Jack and Coke is actually the, if you go, if you look at what people order when they walk into a cocktail bar, uh, there's only one thing that falls in the top 10 consistently that mentions a brand by name. And that is the Jack and Coke. Um, so, you know, people can order, you know, a screwdriver, they can order a gin and tonic, they can order a margarita. Uh, but those can be made with any brand. But when people ask for a Jack and Coke, they don't mean make me a bourbon and cola. They really mean I want Jack Daniels and I want Coca-Cola uh, because there's something very synergistic, magical about the two. I mean, our flavors just really made up well. Uh, and I think it's, and I, I have a little bit of uh, insight on that. At least I think I do that. You know, Jack Daniels has such a clean vanilla note. Uh, it's a very signature flavor of the whiskey. And vanilla does very well in Coke. So much so that they make a vanilla Coke and bottle it, yep. uh, like the old fountains would. But you know, th- to get into the life of Jack Daniel, you know, he he wasn't born into any type of privileged situation. He 
Uh, he was the last child that was born to his mother, uh, the tenth child uh, that she bore, and she died shortly thereafter. So he never knew his birth mother. Uh, he so he was he actually was raised by a stepmother. Uh, so his father remarried, probably out of necessity. His father remarried because he had a young child at home and he needed to work. Uh, so he needed someone to take care of Jack. Uh, so Jack was raised by a stepmother. And through the stepmother, he had three half sisters. So Jack was one of 13 children that were born to his father. And by the time he was a young teenager, his father died of pneumonia. So he found himself orphaned at a pretty young age. Uh, he ended up living with an uncle, you know, a relative uh, for a time because he was still pretty young. Uh, just doing odd jobs around farms. Ultimately, he ended up on the farm of a Lutheran minister whose name was Dan Call. And it was on that that farm that he learned how to distill whiskey. Uh, actually was mentored by an African-American gentleman whose name was Nathan Green. Uh, and this was all prior to the Civil War. Uh, but and, and after the Civil War, when Jack was starting up his brand, actually, uh, this man that, wasn't, that they called Uncle Nearest uh, was a business partner of Jack's. Uh, so they, he not only taught Jack and kind of took him under his wing and taught him, uh, but, you know, kind of helped him get on his feet. And uh, we still have Green family members, uh, descendants of, of Nathan Green, who work here today. Uh, uh, and his sons came to the cave spring when Jack decided to move off the call farm. Uh, but Jack, Jack made whiskey out on the call farm, which is about four miles from where I'm sitting right now. Uh, for about a decade. And then ultimately he had had enough success that he felt like he could buy the distilling equipment. So he was able to buy that from, from Dan Call. He moved it here uh, where we're located now. And what I, what I think was probably on Jack's mind um, was, first of all, he wanted to get on the road that was connecting. Uh, he was sort of out in the middle of nowhere at the call farm out on Louse Creek. Uh, there was a sort of a dirt road path that cut through Lynchburg. Uh, there was a water source that was closer to that. That was the most pristine water in the county. Uh, we've we've gone all over Moore County where we're located. Uh, there is no water source that matches the one that we have here. Uh, being cold and mineral rich and iron free, I think Jack was able. He had had enough success selling whiskey from uh, the call farm that he was able to buy it and move it here. And the the water here, uh, being cold, mineral rich, and iron free, uh, I tell people all the time. Uh, that's a great water. Uh, it's not necessarily a guarantee of success, but uh, starting with bad water is hard to overcome when, when you're making a whiskey because it contributes a lot to the character of it. Use a lot of water uh, in your whiskey making process. But um, uh, it's, you know, iron free. I, I, iron tends to inhibit fermentation, uh, the calcium content as it flows through all this limestone. Uh, this cave spring that's just over my shoulder here, probably 50 yards. Um, it doesn't matter if it's the hottest day of the summer or the coldest day of the winter, that the water is going to come out of the cave at 56 degrees Fahrenheit. It doesn't move a degree. Uh, so it's coming out at ground temperature. That's important because that naturally inhibits any bacteria from being in it. So it's a nice, clean uh, water, uh, mineral rich and iron free. But, uh, you know, he committed to, to making a great whiskey. He made some, uh, some choices that I think were fairly bold, uh, especially if I look at the, the, the bourbons and, and uh, other American whiskeys that Jack would have competed with years ago. Uh, Jack Daniels uh, chose a recipe, for instance, that's 80% corn, 12% malted barley, and 8% rye. Uh, and that 8% rye content is probably the most notable thing in the grain bill because the first American whiskeys prior to prohibition in this country, they were rye. They were rye whiskey. Uh, that, you know, rye whiskey became almost uh, non-existent for a while. It's made a comeback in the last 10 years or so. But, you know, back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, that's the, that's the type of whiskey that people drank. And when you take corn out of the, out of the grain bill and you add rye into it, it's peppery and it's spicy in character. Uh, Jack chose to not do that. Uh, he, he basically dropped that down. We're about a half to a third of the typical rye content of a Kentucky bourbon, especially the older bourbons that have been around for a while. So Jack chose to be sweet and oaky uh, in the world of peppery and spicy. So it just that uh, he was, you know, that was a pretty bold choice. He, he took that, you know, he had confidence in that, that being different and an outlier uh, that it was in the American whiskey world. He went to St. Louis in 1904 and won the first gold medal uh, for the distillery in that year, won highest honors there. And I think because it just stood out, you know, people said this is American whiskey. They were expecting pepper and spice and it was you know, vanilla and oak, it was something completely different. 
I always say sometimes you got to go, you know, go big or go home. Uh, as a, a friend of mine has that that saying, uh, but sometimes you got to risk big to win big. And, and it gives me a little bit of insight into Jack's character. I think he was a risk taker. Um, you know, he started from nothing. Uh, he was an orphan. Uh, he, he built a brand that now is a household name. Uh, and he saw some of that success during his own lifetime. But, you know, ultimately, uh, Jack's life was cut pretty short. Um, he, it was around 1905, 1906. They say he came into the office here and he needed to get some documents out of a safe. It's still the old office is the oldest building on our grounds. It's just right across the street from where I am right now. Uh, there's a big safe in there. And it's very temperamental. I, I know I have the combination, but it takes me usually two or three tries to get it to open, even though I feel like I'm doing it the same every time. Sometimes it just doesn't work. But Jack came in trying to get some documents out of it. He got angry because he couldn't open it and he hauled off and kicked it. It broke his toe and he was too embarrassed to tell anybody about it. So he didn't seek treatment for it, but it set up blood poisoning. So they had to amputate his toe and then his foot, then his leg below the knee, and then his leg all the way up to the hip. So over a course of about five years, they never could hold off the blood poisoning. And eventually that took his life. And I know that's a, just a morbid you know, thing to have to say about somebody. But of course, everything here, we try to impart wisdom to people. And we just tell them that if you should learn nothing else from Jack's life and death, it's that you should never go to work too early because it can kill you. Um, because if he had been the first one in the office that day, he probably wouldn't have been in that position. So, so <clears throat> what is... What do you think is the the main thing that, with his life being cut short, what was going on within that office within the, that kept it going? What were what were the, the the principles and what was the culture that was set forth by this man? And is it the exact same where you sit today as the master distiller? Has it been a traditional thing for this long? But it seems to me like he did not have enough time to really get that message across, like, a you know, like the CEO mentality to make sure that the company would survive without his dream, his vision, his passion. What happened to where it, it would continue? Did he have a, did he have like an intern that was following in his footsteps and, and, and shadowing him so he could take over? Yeah. Yeah. Jack never married. Um, so he was a lifelong bachelor, but he did have a lot of brothers and sisters. Like I was saying, he had, you know, he was one of 13 children that were born to his father. So, he had already enrolled uh, his nephews to help him run the distillery. And the most notable of them would be Lem Motlow. Uh, and I guess I would also include uh, Jess Motlow in that group as well. So uh, Lem was the business minded nephew, the one who knew how to run the business and, you know, kind of keep the books, if you will. Uh, so Jack ultimately ended up willing the distillery to him. And, and he had been getting sick later in his life. He, his blood poisoning was, you know, they never were able to stave that off. So it took about five years but he went ahead and wheeled the distillery to them before he passed. Um, but yeah, definitely Jack understood that he wasn't going to be able to, to grow a big brand if he just sold here in Lynchburg. Uh, but he did, he did build two saloons because prior to prohibition, everything was wet in this country. Uh, he, he understood the connection of, of whiskey and music. Uh, he bought the first uh, musical instruments that we know of in the town and created the silver cornet band. And he would have them play on the square around the courthouse uh, and that would draw people to town. They would go over and get something to drink and sit and listen to the music. And this, of course, this was before radio or people had record players or, or any way of listening to music. The only way to hear music was to hear it live. Uh, so Jack had gotten out and traveled. You know, he'd gone to St. Louis and won his first gold medal. Uh, he had gotten a little bit uh, of culturing, uh, I would call it, but he loved music. Besides whiskey, the, the other love that we know Jack had was music. And he wanted to share that with the townspeople of Lynchburg. Uh, and you see our brand, we still do a lot of things on the music front. Uh, we, we sponsor a lot of stages uh, of music because we feel like, you know, good music and good whiskey just seem to make, you know, good friends and, and, and good times. So we, we're still committed to that as a brand. And that's largely being, you know, true to our, our founders' uh, beginnings. But, you know, you're asking me about what it was that, you know, made Jack, you know, brands that he competed with back in the 1860s and 70s don't exist today. And you know, there must be some reason. Uh, while we're still here and they're not. But there's a saying on the wall. If I go over to Jack's old office, it says, every day you make it, make it the best you can. Uh, um, even though the master's distiller's job description can be a lengthy one, if I had to summarize it into a single sentence, as far as what I'm here to do, it's just that. that that's a nice summary of what a master distiller is or should be doing. 
And that is every day you're making it, just making sure it's the best it can be, that you're using the best grains and water, yeast, not compromising the process. And I've got a lot of help doing that. Um, I've got, you know, really committed employees who, you know, I don't have to go over and police them and tell them, you know, not to, to cut corners because they all take great pride in what we make here. Uh, so, you know, it's just a, it's a, it's a, a position of honor simply because of the people that you're entrusted to lead here and how much they love the brand. You just, you want to be your best for them. And I think they want to be their best for you. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a, it's a great job. Needless to say, uh, well, let's, let's, let's think about this also. And you tell me your opinion on this, Jeff, okay. you keep mentioning, um, ingredients. You said the word mash a little bit earlier. You've said different, the water temperature coming out at ground temp at 56 degrees. Um, I, I think that that's a big part to do with this is the actual, the actual taste, right? Like the actual quality of what we're talking about here. And I've had this discussion on things like hot sauce or salsa and things to where, and you have these salsas and these hot sauces. And you know, like what I'm saying is somebody's like, well, my homemade is the best ever. And I'm, I often think about things like that. It's like, how can you say that your pepper sauce is better than Tabasco? Because at one time that Tabasco was somebody's dream, somebody's local recipe and the demand got so big, you know what I'm saying? So that's how I look at it. Like Jack Daniels, there's a lot of stuff out there that they would say, well, you know, this one's better, this custom one's better, this, this whiskey's better. And what, do you, does that, does that concept make sense to you? Like the quality that goes into every barrel is still there. The love, the tender love and care that goes into that recipe and that barrel. And what your job is, is to make sure that not one drop of that whiskey is bottled to go out to a retail location, a bar, the end consumer without having that stamp, that Jack Daniel stamp of approval on it. Yeah. You know, there's a, a, a saying that I guess probably came during the computer age that if you, it was garbage in, it'll be garbage out. You know, and I think that's definitely true of whiskey, um, that it's hard to overcome. You know, like I said, water is important. Um, you know, great having great water isn't a guarantee of success, but having bad water would probably be a guarantee of failure. It's just hard to overcome it. Uh, but we're, we're blessed with a great water uh, system here uh, that supports the distiller. Every drop of Jack Daniels is made from it. Uh, but then it goes, you know, what's the next thing you're going to add into it? It's your grains. Uh, we're the only distillery, I think, uh, to date that has ever insisted upon number one yellow corn. So uh, in a distillery, you can actually use what you would call a feed grade uh, of corn because you're just going to use it as a substrate. You're going to extract the starches and sugars and distillation in some regards will serve as a firewall. So it doesn't allow some of that stuff to pass over into the finished product. It will be rejected in your byproducts, which is ultimately animal feed anyway. We have local farmers uh, all around Lynchburg and and they're dependent upon us to produce uh, the byproduct off of the distillery because they feed it to their cows. But, uh, you know, having number one yellow corn, the finest grade of grains, uh, choosing something that's a unique mix, as I was saying earlier, that, you know, Jack chose a, a, maybe what was a little bit risky uh, at the time because rye whiskey was king. Uh, he chose to go very low in rye to produce something that was distinctly different. And ultimately that won him uh, some loyalty for people who just wanted something different, you know. I think this is kind of interesting too. You know, if you think about, you know, from our grandparents to parents to us, you know, progressively drinks have gotten sweeter as a whole. You know, my parents grew up drinking water and I grew up drinking Kool-Aid, you know, that kind of deal. Um, so Jack Daniels, because it's higher in corn and lower in rye, tends to be a little bit sweeter on the palate. Uh, so I, I think as long as Jack Daniels has been around 150 years now, it was almost a whiskey that was before its time. Uh, because it was launched at a time when things were peppery and spicy. But it seems with the passing of generations, people have preferred sweet, you know, slightly sweeter drinks. Uh, so that's, you know, instead of becoming dated, becoming grandpa's brand and becoming irrelevant, Jack Daniels has almost gained relevance over time because it was more in the sweet spot uh, of flavor that people were as a whole gravitating towards. So, you know, whether that was just, you know, luck or, or foresight on Jack's part, he, he created a whiskey that was, um, you know, not just great at the time, but it was built for the long haul. Uh, it was it was something that was positioned well to, to do better, even with the passing of time. So, Jack, to your point, it's gone from being, you know, a small brand and, the, you know, a small regional brand back in the 1950s to now uh, being a household name and, and sold in 170 countries around the world. And we're proud that we're still able to make every single drop of it right here where Jack got his start. 
uh, in, in this small town because there's not much here to, uh, to take our mind off of our business. If you visit Lynchburg, you'll see that it's pretty much a singularly focused town. There's the distillery. And that's about it. Uh, that, that's what we do. It's the it's the economic engine of the county. And uh, and I don't know of another. You know, I and you know I we work with Budweiser on the beer end, and Anheuser Busch and Budweiser are is an iconic iconic brand. And if you think about like what you've talked about before, let's think about music and and logos and branding. I don't know how many times I've seen the Jack Daniels front of that bottle. That used by another brand that that kind of emulates that um when you wear a jack daniel shirt or a hat or a bandana it like signifies respect culture that you take it serious i don't know if there's another whiskey i don't know if there's any other spirits brand out there that has that pop of like not only is the recipe and the quality there but now you have this entire culture built around that that you know that quality of what the Jack Daniels brand stands for. And I don't know if, and I think you see that with the Budweiser logo too, you know, the red shield of where people would copy that. And that, that show that is always showing up on shirts more so than any other beer brand in the history of the world. And Jack Daniels, you don't walk around the streets of Nashville or Fort Lauderdale or Los Angeles or any country town in America and see a bunch of branded shirts that are like a clothing brand. It's like a culture. So at what, at what point does that start to pop off in the history of jack daniels i just i want to go into that because you mentioned you know where it became worldwide but then i want to just revert right back to uh, the recipe and some of the crops but do you know in the history of the brand jeff of like when did people really start and i don't want to get into the sinatras and all that that's coming up but when did people start wearing it on their shirt to show that they had pride in this whiskey that they love the taste of you know i i'd say you know you know definitely sinatra we'll get into that a, a little bit later but You know, when you began to see like Keith Richards, Rolling Stones, you know, you started seeing people that were big music acts that, you know, they wouldn't necessarily be wearing the shirts, but they would have the bottle in their hands. They'd be photographed with it. Uh, That became, I think, a turning point where it became more more than just a whiskey brand. It was somewhat a statement of you and your values. And, you know, I I think Jack Daniels has somewhat of a, a reputation, if you will, that it didn't necessarily always follow uh, the the standard guidance. It, you know, Jack was a person that we were talking earlier about. He kind of blazed his own trail. Uh, he, he chose a unique grain bill. He stuck with the charcoal mellowing process when others kind of departed from it, uh, you know, kind of committed himself to it and perfected it. Uh, and it made his whiskey different. And and by standing out, he he gained some fame. And I think most most artists, you know, I think if you if you look at it, most artists don't, don't find it flattery when you say that they sound like somebody else. Uh, they, they want to have a unique sound uh, that, you know, that when you hear them sing uh, or you hear their music, you know, it's them, that they, they're, they're very distinct, but you also wouldn't say, I, I always know that's you because you sound like X or Y or Z. They, they all want to be originals. And I think that's what Jack represents to them too, is it was sort of one of the first and it was very original and it's, uh, you know, it's kind of blazed its own trail and it's it's got maybe a little bit of an independent minded, independent spirit about it that that says something about them. Uh, but, you know, we, you're talking about, the, you know, the, the loyalty uh, people who are willing to wear Jack Daniels T-shirts. Let's talk about tattoos. I mean, how, how many brands that people love so much that they will, you know, a T-shirt is a daily choice. A tattoo is a lifelong choice. So, crazy. you know, you know. Jack Daniels, I think, as a brand, is the most. Uh, there was a study done about it. Um, it is the the most branded trademark that people have on their bodies. I think the the next one behind it is Harley Davidson. Uh, Isn't that crazy? It's a it's, so it it is. They they believe it is the number one most tattooed uh, brand that people put on themselves. Wow, and you think that people that so that's I mean, awesome. I mean, that, that's the that's the person right there that you know is going to be with you forever. Yeah, you know that they're they're. If you're out of Jack Daniels, they'll drink water. That's how loyal they are. I, I, I'm the same exact way, and I'm not kidding. It's uh, it's 
so easy for me to make that distinction, but the distinction of me is my palate of the taste of it. And that's all there is to it. I don't, I'm not going to sit there and go drink something just because it's a famous brand. If it does, if I don't like it. And then the thing about it being a famous brand is that it's amazing. Like it, it's got that taste. And so does Coca-Cola. Like you could sit there in your chair in Lynchburg right now, Mr. Jeff Arnett, and tell me that Pepsi's better than Coke. And I will argue with you until the end of time, right? Until the cows come home. That it's not even close the taste, but I'm not here to just to, to be like a know-it-all about taste. I'm just saying that there, people's palate have, that's the reason why they're loyal to Jack Daniels. When does that ingredient list, and you, I know you can't give away trade secrets, but you are an open book. When does it become mash? What is mash? Is it when it's all mixed together and stirred up and it looks like mashed potatoes? Is that's why it's called mash? <laughs> and why did, and why is the, the, the smell and the aroma of that mash so strong and stout that the entire county or the entire town of Lynchburg can smell it depending on wind direction? Yeah. So we'll take the cave spring water. Uh, flowing at 56 degrees Fahrenheit uh, into the process. And then we bring in three grains. Uh, we bring them in as whole grains. Uh, that that kind of protects them. Every every grain sort of has a uh, has an outer shell uh, that, that protects its inner starches. So you want to preserve those as long as you can. Uh, so we'll grind the grains literally right before we go into a cooking process. But we'll take the water, three grains at the percentages that, that we were talking earlier, 80% corn, 12% malted barley, and 8% rye. And we'll go through a cooking process that's designed to basically get the starches uh, that are resident inside those grains out into a soluble form, uh, put them out on a, on a liquid structure because we basically need uh, those to be unlocked and accessible to the yeast. So it becomes uh, uh, what we would call a mash cook uh, after it comes out of the, the mash cooking process. We heat it up, kind of like make a big corn chowder, if you will. Uh, and then we'll pass it over into the fermenter where it meets up with the yeast. Uh, and then at that point, the yeast will start taking the solubilized starches. Uh, and the, the malted barley actually has an enzyme that's a part of the, the grain bill. And it'll take the, the, the starches, which are more complex sugars, and it starts to reduce them down into simpler sugars. Uh, yeast is a fairly simple uh, organism, and, and, it, and it can't process through starches near as well as it can simpler sugars. So the malted barley provides a natural enzyme action that, that breaks up the starch chains and helps facilitate alcohol making. So then when you get it into the fermenter, the yeast is in there. Then you basically have a fermenting mash. Um, and, and then the liquid that comes off of that, we'll call a distiller's beer. Uh, and that'll be, you know, four to six days later, we get up to about 11 or 12% alcohol uh, in that first part of the process by taking all the starches and sugars and making alcohol out of it. But the, as you're making alcohol, uh, there, you're also, uh, as yeast takes, takes some of the sugar and makes alcohol, it also has another byproduct, which is like uh, CO2. So you'll have a carbon dioxide uh, expression. So that's where the smell comes from. It kind of carries that uh, as it starts to bubble. Right? It almost looks like it's boiling, like it's hot, but you can stick your finger in it. It may be cooler than the room. It could be, you know, 75, 80 degrees, but it's boiling because uh, all these bubbles are coming up. But that's just the CO2 expression. Uh, that's part of the fermentation process, but that puts the aroma into the air. Uh, as soon as that's completed, then it's off to the distillation column where we can uh, separate the alcohol in that liquid and concentrate it. Uh, we'll go from 11 or 12% alcohol up to 70% uh, by passing through the column. So we just still at 140 proof. And when, when that process is taking place and now with the portfolio of Jack Daniels, when you go into a bar today, it's not just old number seven anymore. You got, the single barrel, you got the barrel proof, you got the gentleman, you have rye. My first question is rye before we get into the Tennessee fire, the apple, the honey. The honey was the first one out of the three, like the sweet flavors that you would associate with Jack. Um, where does that process change for the rye? Is the mash still broken down the way it is for the rest of the recipes or is something, does the rye take place before a lot of that, that, that process that you just explained is finished? Yeah, when, when I first became Master Distiller here back in 2008, we had three products, and you, and you mentioned them. We had our old number seven Tennessee whiskey, we had Gentleman Jack, and we had Single Barrel. Uh, actually, the first product that I started working on uh, as Master Distiller was back in 2010, and that was making rye whiskey. Uh, we had already begun to see that rye had gone from being non-existent in the marketplace to kind of beginning to grow again. And, uh, and rye is an interesting proposition uh, 
uh, especially for bartenders that who are looking for something a little bit different than bourbon because they're a little bit more peppery and spicy and uh, they can make some fairly unique cocktails using that as a base. Uh, so we decided to do that, but uh, that is all at the grain level. Uh, so we didn't necessarily change anything else about the process. It was still the cave spring water. It was still the same types of grain, uh, but we went from 8% rye up to 70% rye. So big, basically a nine fold increase in rye content. And we went from 80% corn down to 18. So we basically cut it down to about a quarter of its normal content. So we, we were changing the bias, if you will. We were going to go up in pepper and spice and we were going to go down in sweet because corn is sweet and rye is, is peppery and spicy in character. So yeah, then basically ran the rest of the process through the same, used the same yeast culture, distilled it at 140 proof, put it into a proprietary new barrel that we make for ourselves here that's toasted and charred. Uh, actually, it's it's kind of interesting. You mentioned rye. It's coming out of the ultimate uh, spirits competition just recently. It scored 96 points, uh, which anything in the 90s is considered to be excellent score. I don't know that we've seen a 96 on a Jack Daniels product in quite a while. So our rye is exceptional. If you're looking for something that's a little bit a change of pace off of our old number seven, uh, which it tends to be more sweet and oaky and you want something more peppery and spicy, the rye is, is really nice. Uh, and a 96 point, it's actually made one of the top 100 spirits on the planet and also value priced. Uh, so it's, it's priced right and excellent character. Uh, but yeah, the rye was, you know, it was as soon as it came off the steel here, you could smell the nose. It was very different. Taste it. You knew it was different. We kind of know what the barrel's going to do to it. That was going to put the, the sweet front end and the oak back end on it. But it had this big black pepper, dry fruit center in it. Uh, just exceptional. So we started putting that away in barrels and it was years, of course, years uh, to mature a whiskey. And then after that, we had uh, in, in 2011, we came out with honey. That was our first flavor. And, you know, honey, I was a little bit nervous about honey just because of the whiskey purists out there and how they might view a product like that. Because, uh, you know, you have a lot of people that that follow whiskey and, and they're they tend to be very opinionated and uh, and they can be, to be quite honest, quite snobbish at times that they won't drink certain brands because they do certain things. But, you know, the, the honey did really well for us. Um, you know, it, it's actually the second largest thing in our portfolio of brands now. And it, a lot of people who drink honey never drank Jack Daniels before. Uh, so it brought a whole new drinker uh, to our brand. And we have very loyal Jack Daniels drinkers who would tell me that they never served Jack Daniels after dinner. Uh, and, and like in a, a dessert type occasion, but the honey allows them to do that. They can, they can basically take a product from Jack Daniels because it, it pairs well with ice cream, chocolate, um, uh, other things like that because of its sweet nature. So yeah, honey, honey was an important step for us, I think, uh, you know, and one that I was a little bit worried about, but no longer worried about it for sure. How long, how long before you get this idea in your head or the team at Jack Daniels gets this idea of honey in their head in 2000? Is it in 2008 when you first start? Is it a three-year process to master it to where you guys have the confidence to go to market with it? Or how does that take place and how long? Yeah. You know, to, to, to make honey, we weren't necessarily having to produce a new whiskey. You know, the, the rye thing took us a lot longer because from the time we were distilling it, putting it in barrels, I mean, it was going to be years uh, before the whiskey matured. To make honey, we were actually working off of our mature old number seven whiskey as a base. So that didn't, you know, lengthen the time that it took. So it was really more about just getting the the flavor, the level of sweetness uh, correct on it. And I want to say we probably spent about a year uh, going back and forth on what we wanted to do there. Uh, I, I, I tried at least two different rounds of it. I thought the first round was too sweet. Uh, but, you know, in general, the flavors are going to be a little bit sweeter uh, than just a, a, a straight whiskey. But we, we, we muted the sweetness a little bit. But of course, being a honey product, that's the, that's the nature of it. It needs to be sweet. So but, give me an idea of those first three real quick. You personally, that you know the ins and outs and everything there is to know about old number seven. Let's just let's let's group this. Let's. Yeah, I'm going to ask that question next. That's interesting to me. When does a guy like Jeff Arnett go to old number seven? What are you in the mood for? And then when do you personally pick up a bottle of rye and pour some? Is it neat or on the rocks when you do rye? And are you one of the guys that will sit with your wife after a nice barbecue or dinner and sip on a little honey out on the back deck on a summer night? 
You know, I'm, I, we have 11 products now and, and I'm fortunate to have access to pretty much all of them. Um, and based on my mood, I, I will, I'll change from one to the other. Um, in general, I like single barrel. Um, I, I actually like the bigger character and, and I may not go neat on it. I might, you know, put it on ice and just let it work its way down. So it doesn't necessarily have to be bold and, and, and really high in alcohol. Um, at, you know, our single barrels tend to, even once they've diluted down, tend to have big character about them. So I tend to drink more in that space. But my wife is a huge fan of our Gentleman Jack. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I have a lot of Gentleman Jack at home and uh, she doesn't drink beer or wine. Um, she said neither one kind of set well with her system, but, you know, she never has a problem with Gentleman Jack. She loves it. You know, I think if, I, if I'm trying to make high-end cocktails and, and be approachable, to everyone, Gentleman Jack's probably where I'm going um, to serve and drink. If I don't really know what I'm going to do, uh, and I can only grab one bottle, I'm, I'm probably going to take our old number seven Tennessee whiskey. Um, it's it's versatile. You know, it's just no bar is complete without it. I can drink it on the rocks. I can, you know, pour it in a Coke. I can do a ginger ale. I can make a sour out of it. Now, there's a lot of things I can do with it. Um, like I said, if I just want one quality glass at the end of the day to just sip and savor. I'm going to go to the single barrel. Uh, if I'm about, if I'm having like a pre-dinner drink, a lot of times I will go with the, uh, the single barrel rye. Um, it's, it's a, a really nice whiskey. It's a little more complex than our, our Tennessee rye that just won the, uh, the ultimate spirits or got the 96 points uh, there. Uh, but to me, it's a little bit more complex and a little bit more of a complete package. When you look at all the things that a whiskey can have, our Tennessee rye is very grain centric. It's all pepper and spice. It's almost everything in the glass is, is, is grain more than anything. And a single barrel rye brings on the elements of the barrel, the, the vanilla front end, the oak back, uh, still maintains that peppery spicy center. Um, honey, uh, I tend to want to cut it down with something. Um, you know, I like a tonic water on it, you know, something that doesn't add any more sweetness, but maybe uh, gives it a little bit of a fizz uh, is good. I've put it into a really sour lemonade before that needed to be sweetened a little bit. The honey does very nicely there. Uh, so I don't necessarily, I, I, I you know, it's great chilled uh, as a chilled shot. It, it's 70 proof, but it goes down really, really easy. Uh, but I tend to like to put things in it that, that, that kind of, you know, fizz it up just a hair. Uh, also, with we have a, a Tennessee fire and an apple. The apple, I think, is really good with the ginger beer in it. Uh, that's the way I've, I've been. Ooh, that sounds good. Well, I'm writing yeah, that it's, down. That's good. Wait, yeah. uh, is there a particular ginger beer that you would tell me to get with this? Yeah, no, I just I haven't um, followed particular brands of it. I've just gone and grabbed, you know, one from the grocery store, and they've all seemed to be pretty good. So, uh, ginger beer and apple. Yep. Okay, good. Really, good. really good. Okay, explain to me, Mr. Jeff, on what is the overall consensus, in your opinion, if you had to guess, of the, the, the three mains, the, the single barrel, the gentleman, and the seven, taste-wise, flavor-wise, what do you think is the overall consensus favorite of the Jack Daniels family of drinkers? Well... You know, if you just look at it strictly on a sales basis, it would have to be our old number seven Tennessee whiskey. And and of, of those three, uh, it's the one that I described as being the most balanced. You know, what we look for from a batch of, of our old number seven uh, would be the same uh, balance of sweet and oak notes. We put together about 150 to 200 barrels. They come from different floors of different warehouses. Uh, and we, we try to create something that doesn't have much of a bias on the palate. And we'll get more into that on where flavors show up and how to interpret uh, a whiskey once it's in the mouth. Uh, it's not just what you taste, but where you're tasting it. Uh, that's telling you something about it. But uh, the old number seven is a very balanced expression of a whiskey, equal parts sweet and oak. If somebody doesn't like a lot of bitterness, you know, if you're somebody who tends to stay and, and if you drink wines, but you don't like wines that are overly oak. Uh, then I would say that you're probably going to favor Gentleman Jack. Uh, you know, Gentleman Jack is produced very similar to our old number seven Tennessee whiskey. It's different barrels and different floors, but instead of going uh, to the bottle after it's been matured, it's going to go through char uh, charcoal mellowing a second time. And what happens in charcoal mellowing is 
charcoal tends to absorb bitterness into itself. So all of our whiskey goes through charcoal the first time, right after the distillation process and before the barrel, and it absorbs the bitterness of the grains into itself, and it sweetens the distillate by doing that. Now, once it goes into the barrel, the barrel is going to add on sweet notes and bitter notes. So the barrel has its own set of complex flavors that it adds. If you if you like the sweet notes of a barrel, but you don't like the bitter notes, uh, the Gentleman Jack is the way to go because we're going to take we're, we're going to maintain or uh, the whiskey is going to retain all the sweetness of the barrel, but we'll soften the back end or the exit, the the bitter edge uh, that that a barrel can add. So Gentleman Jack is is a little bit more flavor forward. It comes up on the tip of the tongue. It makes for a great Manhattan because your bitters really shine in it. So it's, I think it's an excellent cocktail whiskey, but very approachable. Uh, so yes. are these words that you're using, the sweet, not bitter, the approachable, the softness, this, the, it sounds like a Southern gentleman. Is that where, is that the marketing that goes behind putting this name to it in the early stages of coming up with the name? Yeah. You know, I think for a lot of people, they would describe it as maybe a little bit more refined, a little more sophisticated, but, but at oh, the same okay. time, it, it, it is the softer side of Jack Daniels. It, it, it because oak, oak is a polarizing uh, feature. Like I said, a lot of people don't really know why they like certain wines or dislike certain wines, but sometimes it's, it comes down to how much oak uh, the wine has on it uh, as, the, as the actual feature. It's not whether it's a white or a red as much as it is it's, it's heavily oaked or not. And whiskey can be the same way. Uh, but, you know, so Gentleman Jack is sort of on the light end of oak. It's got the, the shortest finish. Uh, it's very approachable for that reason because that that one – feature that people might love or hate has just been taken off the table. So you step up in old number seven, you get the balanced expression, equal parts sweet and oak. Then you go to single barrel and, and single barrels can be different. You know, the nature of a single barrel is that they can be really sweet or they can be really oaky. Um, I tell people the only standard that I have for a single barrel is that I want it to be really something. You know, I don't want it to be low character. Uh, I don't mind the movement, uh, but it needs to make a statement. It needs to have good color. It needs to have a good aroma. Uh, but as long as it's really something, uh, whether it be really sweet or really oaky or just, you know, really balanced, all those things are good. But, you know, single barrel is about exploring your palate, learning what you like. Uh, that's, you know, I think we'll see that when we get to the barrel selection later, that you'll have a barrel that kind of comes off as sweeter than the other two. You'll have one that tends to have a longer finish than the other two. And then you're seeing something that is bouncing in the middle. And then you're going to favor one of those. Uh, just, you know, if you're just being honest with yourself. Uh, there'll be one that stands out to you as being, you know, the one you want. And of course, that's what the whole single barrel program allows you to do is to explore your palate. And ultimately, if you'll step up, uh, you know, taste the whiskey up front, and make one your own, you know, just find the barrel that that's uh, that speaks to your personality. Yeah. And I think that, you know, with this program we're talking about, when you talk, start talking about status symbols and in collectibles and things, beer steins or things that would go at the bar business, old, really nostalgic neon lights. Um, you've been there, done that. You've seen it all in cowboy movies, Western movies, Nashville, honky tonks, country music, rock and roll bars, Harley Davidson bars. The Jack Barrel is like the ultimate status symbol <laughs> of, man, you got yeah. a barrel. Oh, my gosh, you got a barrel lid. Like, it's so cool. Yeah. And now this is available. It's been available for a year, a few years now of a customer can come to Jack Daniels and do what we're talking about today, what we're going to do over Zoom, which I wish I was there with you in Lynchburg, and I will be soon enough, Mr. Jeff. But this barrel program and this barrel selection program is a program to where you can come in and taste test and, and go through these flavors and the different parts of the tongue and what it's doing with your palate, pick your barrel. And then I want you to take it from there of it's bottled. You get all the bottles, you get the barrel, you get the barrel lid. You, you can actually get a logo on a little necklace that hangs around the neck, a little medallion that hangs off of the neck of the, of the, of each of the bottles that you get. How does it work? How do we find out information on the how many bottles are made from a bottle? Uh, how many bottles a single barrel do you get out of a barrel? And and how is this available to the general public? How what what do we need to know about it? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, single barrel got introduced uh, in 1997 for the first time, uh, and in that first year that it was in the market, uh, we had some customers who had gotten bottles that came from different barrels, and they approached us and said, you know, we really we liked both bottles. Uh, you know, both the barrels were nice, but uh, just discussing it amongst ourselves, we had a clear favorite. Uh, and if you would give us the opportunity, 
uh, we would love to taste some barrels up front. And the one that we like, we would be willing to buy the entire contents of it. So the first group to ever do that was the Ritz Carlton Hotel. And then others heard that they had done that. And I think five more uh, groups came to us that first year. So we sold about six barrels uh, back when there was no personal collection program. So in 1998, uh, we finally decided, let's just go ahead and let people know that this is an option. Uh, if you're a discerning drinker, you know what you like, you want the opportunity to, to control what the whiskey tastes like instead of just, you know, exploring the, the randomness that can be single barrel. Uh, if you want to take control of that, you can. So uh, this program is, you know, over the years, we first started calling it by the barrel um, and then it became personal collection. But today it represents about 10 percent of all of our single barrel. Uh, so which, you know, a single barrel is like one barrel in a hundred for us. If, if you just look at the count, the stuff that's in our warehouses and what gets hand selected to be single barrel by us, it's about a one barrel in a hundred. And then, then 10% of that being personally selected by a customer, then the, the math starts to change. It's like really, literally like one barrel in a thousand now. So that's, you know, when people ask, you know, just, you know, how special is this? Well, one barrel in a thousand sounds pretty good to me. Uh, the opportunity to pick that way. Uh, but you know, anybody can do this. Uh, what, what we typically do is uh, what if we, we sell these both domestically and internationally uh, and, and they're sold at whatever the market proof is. So it's 94 proof in the U.S. It's 90 and in some in markets outside the U.S. Uh, and in the U.S. we also have a what we call a barrel proof single barrel program. So if people you know don't want the 94 proof option, uh, the barrel proof can be anywhere from 128 up to you know 138. So uh, you get fewer bottles, of course, because the, the liquid uh, contents of the barrel don't change. Um, but when you go with the higher proof, there's less liquid to bottle. So um, what you're typically going to get at 94 proof, I, I've seen them range anywhere from 200 bottles to 300 bottles. But we tell people around 250 is a good, a good estimate wow. of the number of bottles that you can get. If you go at cast drink, that's going to be more like 150 to 180. Uh, it'd be more in that range. In a, in a, in a, in a standard glass the square that's bottom a with the little neck 750 yeah yeah 750 or a fifth basically about a fifth of a gallon uh is the standard um, bottle size but it's a beautiful decanter bottle cork closure to your point uh you can choose artwork uh, if you've got a logo or if you just want some text to put your name on it you can put you know chad's private stop do not touch you know those kinds <laughs> of things on, on your on your uh medallion that then and there'll be a medallion that hangs on the neck of every single bottle but it, it's a great program uh, that's one of the things that's been very fun to do as master distillers. I've I've met with business owners who, who buy them, you know, to sell to customers or to serve the customers. And I've had people that were just, you know, had, had a milestone with their business and just rewarded themselves. I've had people who retired and said, I always said the day I retire, I'm going to go and buy a barrel for myself. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of different reasons why people end up coming to town and wanting to buy a barrel. Uh, each story is a little bit different, but the process is always a blast. Uh, we, we, we take what I tell them up front is a lot of them come to the table kind of nervous because they think that the barrel that they pick is not going to be the same barrel that I pick. But, you know, what I tell them is that, you know, if you wanted to know which barrel I would pick, then I could have saved you a trip to town. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm the expert of my palate and you're the expert of yours. And, and there's not going to be a bad barrel on the table. You know, we're going to we're going to simplify the process. All you need to do is just be honest with yourself. And, 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 and let me know which one you like the best. And there's no wrong choice here. So when I, when I, when I taste these, but I do you, try to, yeah, but I do try to educate them on how to know and how to taste. That's what I need to do. Yeah. And, and I think once, once they understand, you know, why they're tasting and what they're tasting and where they're tasting it and what all that means, uh, it, it just like, you can see a light bulb come on for so many of them that they feel very confident in their choice. So they might be a little bit tentative when they first come in the door, they walk out, you know, Jeff, chest puffed out saying, yep, I picked a great barrel and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to love it. My friends are going to love it. Um, so it, it is, it's a great process. How long from there now that guy and, go, and wife go back to their house in Florida? How long until the, is it come on a pallet? And do you, do you get like a truck that drops this pallet of 250 <laughs> bottles yeah. at Jack Daniels out on your driveway? I, I've, I've seen it done a lot of different ways. Uh, even though we deal directly with the customers when they come to town, um, uh, the way alcohol is sold, it has to go through a distributor. Uh, there's a, there's a three tier system, they call it. So uh, if somebody comes to us and says, I want to buy a barrel, we just find out where they are, what store they want to have it delivered to, which distributor would handle that. 
Uh, we place an order. We will set up a time for them to come here, uh, take a tour, pick their barrel, you know, have lunch while they're in town, do a little bit of sightseeing, and then, you know, head, head back home if they want to, or just spend some time in Nashville, also a great town to visit. Um, and then after that, it could be, you know, a month to two months. Uh, typically, when from the time a barrel is selected, uh, we don't always know the artwork. Uh, that they want to put on their medallion. Those have to be outsourced. We have a company that actually makes those uh, for us. And uh, it takes some time to turn those around and get them back, hang them. Uh, and then it's a matter of when will the next truck be headed to your state. Uh, so sometimes that can be a few weeks that we need to wait to the next shipment. So but yeah, it'll be put on a pallet all together, necklaces on your bottles, coming at you, barrel head that has your barrel number on it. Uh, it tells you all the details of the barrel. Uh, a beautiful, nice display piece uh, that goes along with it. But yeah, but you're looking at about 250 bottles, give or take a few uh, that all have your name. Oh, dang it. Name. Jeff, what, a, great. what, a, what am I going to sound like when I call my guy at Liberty safes and say, I need to order six gun safes. And he says, how many guns do you, are you buying? And I go, no, it's for Jack Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm going to yep. protect these because, you know, I'm letting people know through our association and partnership with Jack Daniels corporate and, um, we're, we're going to be a part of this barrel program and we want to, we want to, you know, be a good voice of it, you know, and we want to fly sure. the flag the right way. And we're going to do a barrel tasting today, but, um, it's one of those things to where. I look at it as a celebration. Um, we always talk about responsibility. We always talk about making sure no underage drinking. We take it very serious because we aren't afraid to admit that we do enjoy Jack Daniels at duck camp. And I think that Jack Daniels is so formidable in that opinion of, Hey, we support conservation. We support the outdoorsman. And you guys have always had a, a strong voice and a placement in that. So I, I don't want to shy away from the fact that yes, we are adults and we do enjoy a Jack Daniels uh, at duck camp. And that's, that's what we do. And we're responsible about it. And we do not abuse it. Um, when you start talking about these numbers, I want to make sure that people understand, you know, these are going to be something that the foul life that we can take and say, thank you to a landowner. Thank you to a farmer for what you do for the, the ecosystem and feeding wildlife and feeding America. Thank you to a conservation effort, you know, or one of our partners might, we might be on a hunt with Benelli and say, Hey, here you go. Thank you very much, Mr. Tom for coming on the hunt. So that's what I think that people can look forward to with a program like this is when you get this, an idea and you want something to be able to have pride in and, and have that medallion hanging from it. And you, went to Lynchburg and you tasted the barrels with Mr. Jeff Arnett and the whole team at Jack Daniels. I think that it's a awesome, awesome program. And I'm excited to be a part of it because we travel the country, Jeff, and we, we have trucks and trailers and production equipment and everything. And it's going to be awesome to show up and say, Hey, thank you for your time. Mr. Billy in Arkansas at our Duckwoods at, at Brandon and Brian's and Todd's duck camp. Like, thank you for cooking all week and give them a bottle of that. And I just yeah. think that that's so significant with the culture of who we are and how it, how it matches up with what the beliefs of Mr. Jack were himself, the music, the camaraderie, the fun, the, the celebration, the respect, you know, all of that is what, what he stood for. And that's what duck camp stands for. So I think it goes along perfect with what we're doing. Yeah. You know, I, I actually have a, a good friend from high school uh, who now uh, runs a company and he started buying barrels from me, you know, years ago, he and his partner will come up at least once a year, they'll, they're going to pick one barrel, sometimes two based on kind of what their inventory looks like, but they go out and bid mechanical work. And he said that from the time he started buying barrels, the way he, to your point, as far as, you know, using them for business purposes, but he said, every time he gets a chance to bid on work, uh, when he drops his bid off, he leaves a bottle of whiskey uh, on it, uh, along with a note that says, you know, we appreciate the opportunity to earn your trust in your business. And he said, I'm not sure it's as much my bid as it is that bottle of whiskey, but his success rate at winning work went up markedly when he started dropping a bottle of whiskey there. It just said something about who he was and the type of person he would be to deal with. And a lot of these smaller businesses are you know, looking for like-minded people who are going to be there and do the job right. And it just it said something about who he was. If he had never worked with them before, they're like, you know, there was one guy that dropped a bottle of whiskey with his bid and they were all pretty close. Let's go with him. <laughs> you know, he's our kind of guy. Um, but, you know, instead of getting all those gun safe, you know, definitely whiskey uh, is one of those things that historically has always had value. Um, you know, that was the way that, you know, currency has become the, the way that people 
you know, the, you know, it's going to replace bartering, if you will, where it's much more likely that people are going to give you cash or credit cards or stuff like that. But, you know, long ago, uh, if you needed somebody to do a job for you, uh, if you wanted to do some some trading, whiskey was a great media to, to, to trade with. Heck yeah. And I, I'm not a, I'm not a big doomsdayer. I have some friends who have, you know, underground bunkers with MREs and, and water stored up and they they've told me that they don't they're not going to hoard a bunch of cash. They're not going to the bank and putting a lot of folding money uh, in a, in a suitcase and and storing it in a bunker. They're storing whiskey up uh, because they said you know regardless of what happens, if everything collapses, the whiskey's probably always going to get you something. Uh, and where the money the money may or may not be valuable in the future, but whiskey will be. So there you go. Now you can just kind of use that as your. Uh, your your savings account <laughs> yeah i love it i, I, I mean I, I plan on doing it every year and being a part of it every year um yeah am i allowed to show these bottles anything on this bottle i can't show the labels on them can i hold them up to the camera uh, is sure. everything cool um yes, so when, when when a customer comes down to, to lynchburg jeff and they want to be, participate in the barrel program a single barrel can you do the barrel program with jack seven gentleman jack or is it only with single barrel it's it's only with single barrel. It's only with single. Okay, so I have three bottles here, and they look like this. They you, they you can tell that they're Jack bottles with not the regular Jack mm -hmm. label, and they mm -hmm. have numbers and like detailed information mm -hmm. that describe. And you have the same ones there. Where we we're going to be yep. drinking out of the we're same bottle. Samples. Yep. They're yep. samples of three different single barrel. Um, barrels that are there, full of whiskey, right now in Lynchburg, Tennessee. Correct. Yes. Okay, uh, what, according to this, my first question, you looking at those labels, Jeff, how many, how high do the barrel racks go, and what racks are these three barrels on? Are they on the bottom rack? Are they high? Now, do, it, does, is it the older the barrel, the higher it sits in the inventory at Jack? How does it work? Now, uh, all of our single barrels, we have over 90 warehouses uh, that we use to mature whiskey here. Uh, if you're talking about everything that we make, uh, but when it comes to single barrel, it's only about a third of those warehouses that are involved. Uh, so about 30 of them. Uh, they rest on three different tracks. So we, we can make single barrel on track one, which are hilltop locations, our oldest warehouses built in the 40s and up to about the late 60s. Track two, where we do most of our bottling, is more of a hillside location. We have 54 warehouses there. Uh, but mostly it's the ones in the upper uh, upper field area that tend to have better air flows and morning to evening sun, a little bit warmer than the ones here down in the valley. So there's warehouses in track two that are really good and ones that we kind of stay away from. It's not that they're bad warehouses, but they just don't produce a super deep aroma color, you know, big character whiskeys uh, predictably. And then we have track three and track three is, uh, is sort of the open plain area uh, between here and Fayetteville next town over uh, and and to me, it's it, it has no trees on the property to speak of. It's it's very flat. Uh, it takes morning to evening sun, a lot of airflow. Uh, there's nine warehouses on that track that make single barrel. Uh, so you know each one provides a unique uh, environment to mature a barrel. But the, the single barrels are always going to come off the upper floor, the highest hottest floor of a warehouse. It's the ones when in the summer when you because when you go on the ground floor of a warehouse in the summer, the ground floor may not be that warm. Might be right. it's a little bit of fog coming off your breath, the humidity. You go to the top floor and you're just sweat popping everywhere. It's like going into the attic of a house in the summer. Uh, so you really want that. Uh, whiskey is expansive in nature. So when it gets hot, it swells. When it gets cold, it contracts. And that's where it's the pushing into the barrel and pulling back that creates that color and the character. And the more you can amplify that action, the better it's going to be. Uh, to create, uh, you know, the deeper aromas and colors that you're expecting from a single barrel. And single barrel should be our, our highest character whiskey of everything we make at Jack Daniels. So do you give me a, a rundown of questions when I get there? Do you say, um, what kind of candy do you like? What kind of soda yeah. do you drink? Do you like water? Do you like coffee? What kind of wine? Are you white wine or red? How do you start to form the first initial, like, okay, I think I got the three barrels I want you to choose from? Okay. Yeah, if it's a first-time selection, what I have learned is what people say and what they mean uh, it can be, there can be a little bit of a disconnect there sometimes. Uh, so on a first barrel selection with a customer, we're going to try to put three samples out that we feel like show the range uh, that, that is out there. So we'll go for something that's pretty sweet, uh, something that's pretty oaky, and then something that we think creates a balance between the two. So you're kind of seeing three different uh, points of this pendulum that swings from sweet to oak. 
if a, if a customer comes back um, and, you know, a lot of times I'll give them the tasting notes on their first barrel selection and they can give me those. Um, then I may steer the selection a little bit differently. Uh, it's still going to be three barrels on there, but I'll go for two barrels that I think align nicely uh, to what they selected in the past. But I always like to throw that one barrel out there that's going to show the difference. So if they, if they picked in the sweet range, I'm still going to provide one oak expression. If they picked in the oak end of the range, I'm going to provide one that's really soft in the oak and really sweet. Uh, just to, because I, what I don't want is all three barrels to be alike. Right. Uh, because I, because I, I've done that before and I felt like I, I kind of stole the selection from the customer. Uh, I also had a customer that told me that they wanted to make sure that their single barrels had a lot of oak in it, uh, that that's what they like. They like big oak. And so I gave them two big oak expressions and then I gave them something that was super soft uh, in the oak that was really just like liquid candy. It was like a candy in the mouth and you swallowed. It just had some heat with a real short finish, not much oak. And that's the barrel they went for. I mean, it was it was the barrel that was at the other end of the spectrum of what they said they really wanted, uh, which that's fine. Uh, but that's that's why you kind of do that. I, I just want some range on the barrels. I could dial it in uh, on your second, third. We, we have customers that have picked up to 50 barrels uh, in, in their past. So once you kind of know a customer's palate, somebody like Eric Church, for instance, uh, where we're doing the special bottling for him. I've, I've been the host of his barrel selections here on multiple occasions. He always picks in the same end of the range. He's always going dark. He wants it oak. He doesn't necessarily like uh, a ton of sweetness. He likes just a little pop of sweet. And then he wants a creamy, long, warm finish. That's that's his profile. Um, so that's how that Eric Church bottling ended up coming into being. Um, wow. So there's going to so, be an actual Eric Church bottle with his name on it. And it's there is. available in different parts of the country. Yep. At his merch stand. Yep. Oh, so, cool. I found I found a lot that just consistently across the board was was an Eric pick, you know, where just every single bear was like that. He would love that one. He would love that one. He would love that one. So we just held on to it and pulled it in, lined them up. And uh, that was, you know. That so was will there it. be a medallion guitar pick around each neck for the customer? <laughs> no, they, you know, historically, we've done the ones that have the chief. Uh, like the complete, chief. Yeah. So we had a, a, instead of having the standard barrel medallion on it, it had the chief. Uh, what looks like the the thing that the the medallion that hangs on his necklace, or his personal one. They did a uh, uh, a reproduction of it, and it was on all the bottles. But this That's bottle, cool. this bottle is all black. It has his graphics, what he approved. Oh Chose wow! Process with the with the charring fires blowing up through them. Save me one, Jeff. Sneak one out oh, of there for me. It's it's exceptional. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to so you. So when when Casey and Tommy bring you this partnership and introduce you to me, what do you go off of when you put these three bottles in that box and, and overnight it to me, what are you thinking? Um, I'm not there. I can't do 50 like Eric gets to do. I got three here in right. front of me. Did you take right. a wide range with these three or did you kind of just think, Oh, he's a duck hunter. He probably likes red meat. Um, he likes, you know, how, how did you come up with these? Well, for these three barrels, you actually have two different lots of whiskey. So they were not entered into the same warehouse on the same day. So that's going to create a little bit of a, uh, of movement uh, because they came from different warehouses, but then you have two that came from the same warehouse, uh, but were most likely picked. Uh, I didn't hand pick these two, but the people that are doing this and, and basically follow what I've asked them to do will usually find some that are have different colors. Uh, color isn't always a, a perfect indicator of character, but if you've got something that's really dark and something that's a little bit lighter, uh, in, in general, oak follows the color. So that, that kind of allows us to, to pluck out uh, samples that we think might be a little bit more sweet and forward versus ones that are going to be a little bit heavier and oakier. So uh, they can just physically look at the samples and it's, that can be indicative sometimes of what you're going to get, but we're just looking for a range here. Uh, so you've got two different entry lots and you have um, two, like I said, two barrels that are coming off the same warehouse, but being, I have seen two barrels that set side by side in the same warehouse, the same number of days be more different than two barrels that were in different warehouses produced in different years. Really? It really comes down to the toast and char of the barrel. Uh, that has more to do with, with the character of the whiskey than anything else. Does it matter which order we taste these together today, or is no. there a strategy here? Um, there is a strategy. There is a strategy. Is a strategy. Yep. Perfect. So um, what I typically do is, you know, I tell people, you know, look at the whiskey. I mean, it's just admire it. It's beautiful. 
you know, the whiskey will kind of, based on how deep the, the glass is, kind of go from a brownish yellow to a brownish orange to a, almost a reddish hue. Um, I always like to look for the red notes, uh, especially when I'm looking in a tulip glass. Uh, it, it should give me enough depth that I can see a little bit of uh, almost like a cherry uh, red note starting to shine in it. Uh, after that, I I'm going to go to nose. Yeah, I'm going to go to nose next. Um, I don't think that nose is the most important thing when it comes to picking a whiskey. It should be flavor first. Uh, but the nose is important because it is a part of the experience. But I ask, I typically ask somebody if they've got them out in the glasses, just go through and nose. You can. So I should pour. I, hold on a yeah. second. I should yeah, pour go, these go in ahead the glass. Yeah, well, I wanted that. to say one thing, Jeff, on this bottle here, which is like the standard, the famous looking Jack bottle. I can see the cherry in there vividly, like right where the neck ends and it starts to widen out into the, yep. into the body of the, of the bottle. I yep. can't see it. I can't see it on this bottle. How do I? Oh, okay. Yeah. Look, look yeah. Look through where you've got more depth. Oh yeah. It should start. You see a little bit of a reddish note. Oh, I see it really good on yours and yep. mine now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Got it. Yeah. So the view, the viewing depth will, will play a part in it. Even the darkest of whiskeys, if it's, too thin of what you're viewing through the light kind of burns through it. But, um, I usually use the same size bottle. Um, okay. So pour each one into uh, about a shot into each one or so. Yes. That'd be plenty. I'm actually pouring Jack. Daniels. I, went ahead and, I went ahead and got ahead of you. I pre poured. Now, uh, is that going to give you the, is that going to give you a better flavor? Cause they're aired out more. No, no. Um, I I'm know. not, I'm in an office. It doesn't, uh, there's not like a fan blowing. If anything, you really want to pour the, the samples fresh. Um, okay. I, that's what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually yeah. pouring fresh Jack Daniels on yeah. microphone. Yep. Yeah. Can you hear that? I'm going to let him hear it one <laughs> more time. Okay. So that's that one. That's that one. And this one is going to be over here. I hope y'all can hear this. This is no, logo no branding no label on the bottle this is the barrel program this is single barrel being poured okay mr jeff i got all three my glasses ready all i right. got my bottle sitting next to him so i know which no which, which is barrel which. we're picking okay well what i typically ask people to do is to nose them first um and when it comes to form when you're when you're checking aroma on a whiskey it's entirely up to you. Uh, science says that you're going to be able to smell better. You're going to smell more aroma if you have your mouth open throughout the process. I tend to always start with my mouth closed. Uh, just sometimes the samples are pretty powerful. And I feel like I'm, I, I can tease out minor differences a little bit better if my mouth is closed. But the, the main thing is it's important that you not smell one sample with your mouth open and one with your mouth closed. If you're changing your form as you go from sample to sample, you're actually introducing variables that are not related to the, the whiskey itself. So just be consistent in your form. You can nose across them with your mouth closed. If you feel like you're struggling to smell differences, then go ahead and open your mouth and just kind of smell back uh, across them again. I ask people to do this because I think it's important up front to just, if you, can, if you have one that you like the aroma on the best, go ahead, just make note of that. If you're going to take notes on this, just kind of say, hey, if it's if it's 1267, uh, that one barrel, if you like the smell of it the best, then note that. If it's uh, 3265, note that. If it's 3267, note that. But do your best to try to get a force rank uh, on the nose, which is your favorite and which is your least favorite. And, and it'll all smell good, but it just, you know, try to try to split them up if you can and rank them. Yeah, to me, there's nothing objectionable in any of them. They all smell pretty nice. Um, I think if uh, I think twelve sixty seven maybe smells slightly sweeter okay, on the so notes as compared to the other two. I, I that was the first one I smelled, and I absolutely loved it. Like first, that was uh, I'm going to smell yeah. the second one now. Yeah, yeah. To me, twelve sixty seven. If that was the first one you smelled, it almost smells like a stick of juicy fruit gum. Uh, it's, it's so just, like it's like man it's good it's real yeah it's real it it's does sweet. it smells like a stick of gum yeah like juicy fruit gum man okay so then that's 1267 okay yep. so now the next one that i'm going to try is 3265 okay uh, 
Now, on first on my first nose, my first smell of that one, it doesn't smell to me like it's got what the twelve sixty seven has. Like it doesn't smell like it's there for me in that yeah, one yet. I would tell you if you, if you're wanting some sweet notes, it's much more muted. It, it it has a little bit more of a what I would describe as a a little bit more earth uh, oak, slightly earthy but less sweet on the nose. That one right there, that one I just did. Yeah, on thirty two sixty five. Big difference. Huge difference. Like between those first two. Like I almost have to smell harder to get something out of the thirty two sixty five. Yeah. Is yeah. that what you're and getting like I, to? It, well, yes. And like I said, uh, if, if you're not using your mouth, you know, nosing with your mouth open, that might be where you want to do it if it helps you open up um, and, and discern a little bit more. Okay, so now I'm on to um, 3267, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm saying that my order for me is by far 1267 would be my pick through smell. Second would okay. be 3265. Third would be 3267 okay. in that order. Well, that's good. Um, and now, now the disappointing news is that sometimes the nose and the flavor don't follow as cleanly as you might think they would. Uh, sometimes the one that's your favorite on nose uh, maybe can disappoint because uh, it doesn't, uh, you know, it's just sometimes ones that don't smell very sweet are the sweetest on the table uh, when you get to the flavor. So just be beware of that. But the reason I'm asking you to, to rank the nose now is that it's very common when people taste three barrels that, that they're going to kick one off the table right away. They're going to say, I don't like that one but they're really going to struggle between the other two saying, I really like them both. And it's very hard uh, to choose between them. And I think just the nose, off the, just off the nose, or you're talking about when they taste it is what you're when saying. they taste them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll because with, the, the, with the nose, like it's, it's a runaway right now with my nose. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and hopefully it will match up on flavor and it's going to be the runaway on flavor too. But if it isn't, let's just say you taste all three and give each one, you know, their fair shot. Um, if, if you're down between two, that you really like, that you're struggling to pick one or the other. I always say that the nose is your best tiebreaker. So kind of knowing that the, that 1267 is your number one, 65 is your number two, 3267 is your third. Um, if you are if you get down between 65 and 67 um, on the 3265 and 3267, then I would say uh, if you're liking both of them, you probably ought to go to 3265 because it had the better nose to you. If that makes sense. So to me, to, to me, the aroma should be, it's your best tiebreaker criteria, but it is secondary to flavor. I'm taking notes on, in, into my yeah. phone as you tell me yeah. this, because I want to, I want to be able yeah. to, to talk about this when, yeah. even when I'm not with you. So I want to make sure in a synopsis that I tell that story, right. That the, the, the aroma is not, the 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 go to it's going to be taste but some people most people are going to come down to a standstill a standoff of two of those with their taste and now you're saying let that aroma be my tiebreaker yeah and and it may be that you have a clear winner you know it, it, it does but like i said it's always good as you're going into the process before you start tasting to go ahead and just know how you would rank them on nose and then let that play in as to, to tip the scales if you see two barrels equally, uh, let let the nose be. I want I want some Jack Daniel's chapstick in this flavor yeah. right here from this barrel because that apple chapstick's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Well, I, I always tell people if a, if a whiskey tastes good and it smells good too, then it should be considered a double winner. Uh, so that's you know that's what we're shooting to get here. But we're going to go with flavor first and foremost. Whatever tastes the best is the one you're going to want to get because the nose softens greatly in the in the drinking unless you're in a in a glass where you're really concentrating on it, the nose is much less important than the flavor. Okay. So uh, th- now as strategy goes, how do you taste whiskey, Mr. Jeff? Okay. All right. So um, even though we all tend to describe flavors differently based on what's in our diet, uh, the things that we're familiar with, we'll tend to describe them in those terms. Uh, all of our palates are arranged the same. It doesn't really matter if you're a whiskey connoisseur, big drinker or not. Uh, you have sweet taste buds on the tip of your tongue. You have sour on the sides and underneath your tongue. And then you have bitter taste buds on the back of your tongue and throat. In addition to those three, you also have salty taste buds. And they tend to be somewhat randomly dispersed. Um, I, I, 
you know, prior to coming to Jack Daniels, I made Pringles potato chips and in my hometown of Jackson. And if a chip was salted, it didn't matter if it was on the tip, the side of the back, you could detect the saltiness of it, but everything else is largely group. So I tell people when you're tasting, it's not just what you taste, but it's where you're tasting it in the mouth that you should pay attention to, because that's going to tell you something about it. If you put one of the whiskeys in and you swallowed it and it feels like the flavor is very forward, it's all in the front half of the mouth, it's finishing quickly, then that's a sweet barrel. And I describe the sweet flavors of Jack Daniels to be vanilla, caramel, butterscotch. Those are things that people tend to you know, understand and know what they taste like. Uh, but you may have a barrel like that and then the next, very next barrel behind it may not have much sweet notes at all. It may get off the tip of the tongue very quickly, it may get, kind of just be long in the finish and almost all the flavors in the back of the throat. That's an oaky barrel. Uh, like I said, not, nothing about this is good or bad. Some people like sweet and some people like oak. It's the, it's the same difference as people who say, I like chocolate, but I prefer dark chocolate over milk chocolate. Gotcha. Uh, that's, that's makes total sort, sense. That's sort of that's sort of the decision that you're making here. Are you an 80, 90 percent cocoa, dark chocolate kind of person? Are you a milk chocolate person? Or are you somebody who's more in the middle? You know, you're a 30, 40 percenter uh, where you like you like some sweetness and you also like, you know, a semi bitter you know, depth of, of flavor. So what we hope is that the barrels represent those types of choices, uh, but using whiskey as, as the influence of flavor. So but what I tend to do is I'll take. When I when I get on these samples, these are 94 proof, uh, so that's a fairly we're going to drink them neat. Um, I take in the first sample, hold it on the tip of my tongue, let it ease to the center, and then swallow it, giving each zone about a couple. Hold of it seconds. on, hold it on the tip. Yep. So now, yeah, so now how do you, now do you drink in the order of your favorite through smell, or do you? Does it doesn't matter. Or it should you matter. mix? Should you mix them up and try to trick your senses now? Now, what I would tell you is that it doesn't really matter what order you go through on these. Uh, but whichever barrel you start with is, is going to be disadvantaged because it's first, uh, because it's going to acclimate your palate. You know, the first sip of a 94 proof whiskey, that's a fairly high alcohol. So it can be a little bit startling to the palate. So whichever one you taste second or third automatically seem a little bit softer or smoother simply because they weren't first. So you'll want to take that into consideration. What I tend to do is I, I'm going to start on 1267, then I'm going to move to 3265 and then to 3267. Um, but I'm going to go back to, to 1267. After I get to the end, I'll go back to it one more time and I'll take notes on it on the second pass. Why, why, why explain, explain your reasoning real quick. Yeah. Uh, say the order one more yeah. time, please. And then explain okay. the, re the reasoning. Sure. Okay, so yeah, it doesn't really matter if you've got three barrels in front of you. Uh, you can start on the first one. Uh, what I tend to do is taste it, but I don't take notes on it. I don't necessarily, you know, too, I don't judge it too harshly, but I use it to acclimate my palate and I get that first impression of it. But I'll rinse and clear, and then I'll go to the second sample and I'll take notes on it, and I'll rinse and clear, then I'll go to the third sample, I'll rinse and clear, and then I'll go back to the first sample. First one. To give it a chance. To give, to give it one more try. And then I stop. Uh, one of the things I've, I try to tell people is that, you know, you're, you're, you're going to get fatigued. Uh, there's only so much high-proof alcohol the tongue can handle before it just kind of goes a little bit numb. So you're, you're the most discerning on the whiskey early in the process. Um, if we were tasting, you know, five, six, seven, eight barrels in a row, by the time you're hitting barrels six, seven, and eight, they're all good. And it's getting harder and harder to tease out those differences. That's why we limit it to three well-placed samples because you're going to see the range. You're still going to, you should not be fatigued. You do get a little bit of carryover. Uh, so understand that your second sample will be somewhat colored by the sample before it because there'll be a little bit of residual flavor from it. Uh, so what I typically do is I go across the one time back to that first sample, then I stop. I'll look at my notes and based on what I have written about the samples, I'll go to the one that my notes most intrigue me uh, as being the type of whiskey I'm looking for. And then I'll just go ahead and take that second sip, third sip, just kind of start sipping at it and make sure that you've got a good clean read on it, uh, that it's reinforcing what your notes say about it and that it is your favorite. I always say if it's getting better with each sip, then you know you pick the right one. Um, uh, so, okay. So you say your order one more time, please, Jeff. Okay. So, yeah, so I'm going to, I'm going to, in this case, I'm going to pick, uh, the number sample that you that you talked about first, which is twelve sixty seven. That's going to be your first taste. 
That's gonna be my first taste. So hold it on, hold it on your tip, let it go to the middle, yeah, I, and then swallow. Yeah, I take in what I call as a thimbleful. I take what I can hold and concentrate on the tip of my tongue and let it set for a couple of seconds, and I let it roll to mid palate and kind of hold it in the center of my tongue, and then I'll swallow it. And that's recognizing sweet, sort of sour, uh, and then bitter. Now, in that sour zone, the whiskey shouldn't be sour, but in the center of the tongue, you also have what is called the savory zone. So every liquid will have a mouthfeel, and it can be like water or milk. It could be buttery, creamy, oily. Uh, it could be dry and tannic. It could be crisp. So I typically note that. What is the general mouthfeel? Is it, is it kind of dry, tannic? Is it leaving my mouth feeling a little bit drawn? Does it leave my mouth feeling like it's kind of got butter or oil on it? Uh, is it really clean and creamy? Uh, so, or is it crisp? Is it kind of pricking at my tongue? So those are all things that I'm going to, to note uh, when it comes to, to tasting the whiskey. Um, so I, I typically comment on what's the level of sweetness on the front, what's the general mouthfeel at center palate, and how long is the finish. Those, those three elements, that's how I'll distinguish them from, from one another. Does that make sense? Totally. I'm excited. All right, All right let's, let's go for it. I'm going to go ahead and taste the, this first one. This is the one I thought, you know, you, you pointed it out. It really had a, a great nose on it, for sure. To me, it's balancing up pretty well. Like I said, I'm not going to take notes on it on this pass, but it has a sort of a vanilla caramel uh, entry on it. Has a little bit of weight at the center. It's got the oak. You got you got that little trickle of oak going out the back. Mm -hmm. um, it felt a little bit crisp, uh, but like I said, this is 94 proof, uh, and that's our first taste of whiskey. Um, it's it's kind of interesting that we'll comment on it now, and also when we comment on it when we come back to it probably we're going to feel differently about it. Yeah, because that Christmas night, that crispness might go away, like you're saying, and get a little smoother after. It will. Because that's the unfair uh, of being the bullet, of being the first mm -hmm. one out. Yeah, the first the first sample, regardless of which end of the samples you start on, is disadvantaged by going first. That, mm -hmm. that is absolutely true. So what's your second? I'm going to go to 3265. Okay. Which was, which was your second favorite on nose. Do that same process, hold it on the tip, let it roll to center, swallow it, and then think about where is the flavor. And I'm going to take notes this time. I'm also taking notes. Okay, that's, to me, that sample felt, it felt a little less crisp in the center, uh, where the first one kind of, you know, I would describe it kind of pricked at the tongue a little bit. Yep. Uh, this one muted it. There, it. It was almost like if that first sample was 94 proof, you would guess that this was a lower proof. Uh, and it's because it, it felt like it was a little bit more settled on the palate. I described it being a little bit more buttery, creamy in the center. This is what I said. I said smoother, went down easier and better, and it had a yeah. much better aftertaste to me, which is that yeah. that oak going out the back, that creamy going yeah. out the back, right? Yeah. I, you know, it's it, to me, it actually, you know, knowing the range of all the barrels that we have, pretty nice balanced expression, big creamy, almost slightly buttery center, kind of had a great, you know, depth to it. It felt like it had weight on the palate. Uh, but when you swallow it, it's not like it's lingering forever. It just has a, it, it lingers just long enough to balance the sweet notes out. So, you know, to me, that's a, that's a really nice balanced expression of a barrel. It's got sweet and oak. I'm um, surprised. I, I, I think argue I'm, that. I think, I mean, depending on my second go around with my first bullet, I think that the, I, I call the bullet the first one out in competition duck calling. If you draw the number yeah. one pill, mm -hmm. the judges hear you, but they really don't give you a high score sometimes because they don't know what's coming after you. Right. And that's the same right. thing we're going through here. So, yeah. I've noticed that in bull riding too. <laughs> yeah, bull riding too. Yeah, anything. That yeah. Well, a full eight second ride later in the competition usually scores a little better. Yep. Or this ones. But. So this is going to be 3267. Yes. Are you taking notes? I am.
can I talk first on my notes so I don't so people don't think that I'm just trying to say what the master distiller is saying? Yeah. I thought that it was more crisp on the tip of my tongue, and I did I did not like it nearly as much on the back end going down as I did the second sample. I, it had a, it had good flavor, and the flavor was but the flavor was not as good as my second sample. Yeah, if I were comparing it, uh, this. I described the center or the general mouthfeel of that second barrel to be more in the buttery, creamy range. This one's creamy, but it's slightly tannic. So it left, it left my mouth feeling a little bit dry uh, after the exit, mm -hmm. where I was kind of reaching for the water a little bit faster than sometimes I normally would because I just felt like I needed to rehydrate. Um, it, it also, on the sweet notes, um, the second barrel I said was a caramel. That's, a, that's a, a, actually a more complex form of sweet. Uh, this one I said is vanilla. That's the simplest form of sweetness. So it, in general, if I'm comparing the second barrel to the third barrel, the second barrel is is richer, sweeter, uh, less tannic and dry. Uh, but but once again, you to your point, it's still it's still good. Uh, but I think based on you know just overall balance, I think barrel number two is kind of edging it out right now. If you're just looking for something that's very well rounded. Um, you're, you're getting a little bit more into what I would describe as, uh, into indulgent choices. A lot of people don't like uh, tannic notes. Um, you know, I, I don't rule a barrel out for it because some people really like a dry whiskey. Uh, and, and single barrel allows you to get that from us. But yeah, right now, I think, I think to, to your aroma notes and flavor notes, you're probably favoring number two. But just to be fair to the first sample, uh, because it was disadvantaged by being first, let's go back and hit it one more time. Yeah. Uh, see what you think there. Man, I wanted to pick number one. That's yeah. Totally different on that round, wasn't it? Completely like <laughs> way different. Yeah, it might be back in first place again. <laughs> it's delicious. Yeah, it is. Isn't it? Like it wasn't even the same shot. It was like your mouth was yeah. ready for it then, just like you said. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, it it doesn't really matter where you start. the the first sa The first sip is always going to kind of shock the palate of hair. Uh, so it's just not fair to go across them one time and stop. I think you've got to go back to that first sample and at least give it one more uh, consideration. But I usually think that kind of if you do that, uh, you're you're already at a point where you you probably say it. Hey, thirty two sixty seven is out of play here. Um, you you have something to consider between twelve sixty seven and thirty two sixty five. Those are both ones that you like the nose on, you like the flavor on. Um, in this case, if you were saying I like the flavor equally, uh, we know that twelve sixty seven was your favorite nose. Uh, as so well. am I allowed to, now? This is the point to where you say just sit back, relax, and, and sit for a second. Yes, I think I think it. Usually when I get to this point, I'm looking at my notes and saying, which one looks to line up to what I'm looking for here? Which one most intrigues me? Sounds like something I'd want to drink. And just go to that one and just start sipping at it, making sure that you're, you've got a good read on it, that your notes are accurate, that each sip is reinforcing what you've written. And I think that if, if it's just getting better as you go, you know that you've got the right one. I actually know I actually know a little bit about this lot that you're picking out of on uh, on 1267 uh, because it, we also have used that lot to make some barrel proofs uh, here recently. Uh, I was telling you a little bit about our different tracks of warehousing here. Uh, that 1267 barrel is actually coming off of track three. It's, it's coming out of one of those nine warehouses that's on the open plain that gets. Uh, it has basically unobstructed air flows. It gets morning to evening sun. So the warehouses tend to be pretty cold and pretty hot uh, based on the, the changing of the seasons. That, that, that is Those nine warehouses, that's a really good track of property for us. I, I tend to favor it um, with barrels that I, that I particularly like. Yep, it came out of warehouse 305. 305? Mm-hmm. Top floor of warehouse. I'm having floor. a really hard time base. I'm having a really hard time just based on flavor right now with these two. Yeah. Well, they're both really nice. And, you know, a lot of people are going to use a little water 
um, or ice, they're going to dilute it. So if you're, if you're liking those two barrels, you might want to just put an equal amount of water in each uh, and just see how it opens up. You know, whiskey changes in character when the proof changes. So we're I'm 94 right. proof period. It'll change all the way down to 40 proof. Um, so then things can hide behind the alcohol. So it's like an onion. You can peel its layers back. Um, I actually like single barrel on the rocks because that's that slow yeah. down that comes off of it. Not only is every barrel different, but literally every sip in the glass can be different just because it's kind of peeling itself back for you. But I, I, I honestly think after I just tasted, I tasted the second sample again for the second time. And then I went back to my first sample for a tiny sip, like you said, to do with the first sample, because yeah. I've narrowed it down to these two. And I honestly think that I would choose the first sample now that I got it out of the way. And it's go, it just, it's just really good to me. I, and here's why I think that the final, my final judgment of my decision-making process would be that it honestly tastes like a little creamy, buttery, butterscotch flavor going down. And that aftertaste just tastes really good. Almost like the smell of it almost was. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there was no disconnect. Uh, sometimes there can be. Sometimes you get a really sweet nose, and then you don't have a lot of sweet notes in the whiskey. This, in this case, it's matching up very well. Um, I just put a little water uh, in that sample as well, that twelve sixty seven sample. It dilutes well. Uh, so if if somebody were to you know put a drop of water in it or put an ice cube in it, it I think it's it's nice in that regard too. So you, you sometimes you want to consider that not everybody's going to be a neat drinker, um, and and. Sometimes between two barrels, that can help you decide if you'll put a little water in each and watch how they open up, re-nose them, taste them, uh, and which one suits which one suits you once the proof has dropped a little. Okay, so I'm going with the 1267. Okay. I think that, and, and if you were me and you were making this decision, what would you have gone with for your palate? I'm going to go with 1267 as well. Uh, like I said, I, t I tend to go after barrels off of track three for whatever reason. I, I think if there is this honey hole area of our warehousing, it is those nine warehouses. Uh, consistently, when I see bar or lots that come out of there that I think are better than our standard, uh, it's it's from there for just for whatever reason. Um, and that one, I love the nose on it. Um, I knew leading off was going to disadvantage it, but you know, coming back to it, it, it really broke in nicely. Uh, but I would choose 1267 for, for this main reason. If somebody is, a, is fairly new to whiskey, uh, that is not going to overwhelm them. You know, for a 94 proof, that's very approachable. Uh, if somebody is a big whiskey drinker and likes something that's, that's rich and complex and interesting, it also checks that box too. Um, so if you can balance off being complex and interesting to a mature drinker and also, you know, suit someone who's pretty new uh, to whiskey, uh, that's a really nice one. And, and it sounds like you're going to be giving these bottles to a pretty broad range of people. They mm -hmm. might be big whiskey drinkers. They may not be, but I think anybody who opens that bottle is going to be impressed with it. God, it's good. It the aftertaste is really, really good of 1267, but that, that second sample, um, it's not far behind on my palate, that 3265. Yeah. 30, 3265 has a little more Oak. Uh, when you swallow it, it tends to linger a little longer mm -hmm. here in the back where uh, the, th the 1267 is really rich and sweet. And it after you swallow it, it lingers for just a little while and then it's gone. Uh, the 3265 has a little bit more length of, of finish. Um, I, th we were talking about it earlier, though. You know, Gentleman Jack is our answer to not everybody loves oak. Uh, and some people have a you know big tolerance for it. Some people don't have much tolerance for it at all. Um, you know, if I'm looking, if I'm just looking at pros and cons of those two barrels, if you're, if you serve that 1267 to someone, uh, who, who does like Oak, they're probably not going to be disappointed in what they got. Uh, it's still going to be really good and interesting and big. Um, but if you, if you serve, if you chose the 3265 and you served it to somebody who really doesn't have much tolerance for Oak, then they're going to kind of, uh, you know, they'll drink maybe one glass of it and I'm done. Uh, so that can limit. Uh, people's ability to to enjoy it. Um, I, I, I describe it. I'll occasionally drink a beer, and if I do, if I'm gonna have a couple. Sometimes I'll start with a big hoppy IPA uh, just to start, uh, but I typically won't do two of them uh, because it just tends to almost need something to clean the palate off after that. 
And that's the way oak can be. Um, if, if, a, if a whiskey has too much oak in it, what is really pleasant in a single glass uh, is too much for the second and third glass. If you're assuming you're going to be out for a little while and have a few, have a few drinks. Uh, so oak can limit session uh, more than any other feature. Um, so I think that's the, one of the benefits of 1267 is we're going to be very sessionable. Uh, if somebody wants to pour a couple of glasses, they're going to both come out of that bottle. They wouldn't look to trade off. Uh, it'll be good on the first round. It'll be good on the second. So a lot of strengths there for that reason. Um, but, you, but the, nose, the nose too. I mean, the nose is just phenomenal. <laughs> the nose is phenomenal. I love yeah. your analogy of the stick of juicy fruit, which is the best tasting gum for seven seconds yeah. until it runs out of flavor. Right. And, um, <laughs> until the talk, sugar's gone. <laughs> talk to me real quick again, yeah. reiterate real quick, Mr. Jeff track three, if you will, please. Yeah, so we have three tracks of property here that, that we warehouse on. So track one is the original uh, land that rests above the distillery. Uh, hilltop locations have a lot of tree cover, uh, but those trees tend to block air flows uh, and they can partially obstruct the sun from hitting the, these are uninsulated metal buildings. So the sooner the sun hits them, the faster they warm up, longer they hold it. Uh, so that's track one. Track two is more hillside type location. Uh, track three is our biggest open area uh, that we have. Uh, it's flat. Uh, it takes morning to evening sun. It has high air flows. Uh, so, you know, I think all those things are beneficial. Uh, it's not that the, we make great whiskey off of, I mean, like our heritage barrel, for instance, it was the top, the number three whiskey on the planet a couple of years ago. It was matured on track one. So even, you know, with some obstructed, you know, sun and air, those warehouses really perform well uh, and they can make fantastic whiskey, but track three is just a little bit of a sweet spot. I think those, those warehouses for whatever reason really do well. And, and this barrel that you're uh, looking at 1267, that's just where it came from. It is a track three, uh, actually top floor of 305, uh, which is in the middle of the nine warehouses that, that reside down there. Okay. So, you're the master distiller, Jack Daniels. You know exactly where that barrel is right now. You could go out with your <laughs> blindfold on and grab it. How many yeah. bottles do you think are going to come out of that barrel? Do you have off the top of your head? Could you could you nail it within five bottles? No, I can't. Um, you know, sometimes when I see um, something that doesn't have a really long finish, uh, sometimes that means that there's a little bit more liquid in the barrel. Um, so you might yield a little bit more, but the, that doesn't always hold up to be true. Uh, sometimes when it's really dark and oaky, it means that the, the angel share is higher. So you're going to get fewer cases, but really wouldn't have a good guess. You know, I, I would just say that, you know, it's going to be somewhere in the range of probably 40 to 43 cases. Uh, that, that would be a good range. It could be 38, uh, but that's, you know, normally they don't go below 40 and you're looking at six pack cases. So let's just say 240 bottles, 40, 250 uh, is, is what it should be. And that's the 750. It's a, yeah, and, and the 750 ml or what they would call a fifth of a gallon size bottle. What all size bottles is single barrel sold at retail in? Uh, we have a 375 that we do the barrel proof in, which is the, the small one, and uh, then a 750, and then also a liter. Uh, and liters are typically just for uh, bars and restaurants. They're a little bit. Sh they're a little bit more. Have a little bit more square bottom to them. Yeah, well, they're just, they look kind of the same dimension. Like same, but just bigger. bigger. Yeah, they, they try to hold all the dimensions the same. Still a decanter. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the liter bottles typically only go to bars and restaurants. That's their standard size. Um, it, it's easier for them if they're looking at a bottle. Uh, 40, 40 ml is, a, is considered a, a drink shot. So a liter bottle is 25 servings. And it just, they can look at the bottles and the serving sizes and it just all the math is easier for them to figure out what a cocktail should sell for uh so the, the leader is the sort of universal standard that bars and restaurants want to purchase um if you go to a package store in the u.s you're looking at 750s and 175s as sort of being the big size but we don't make a 175 uh, single barrel don't make a 175 no could you imagine and the, big, the, and the big, biggest bottle we make here is a three liter uh, those are not legal in the U.S., but you can go to Canada and parts of Europe. But that's a man, that's a big one. <laughs> if they'll can only let you take one bottle across the border, that's the <laughs> one you want. <laughs> yeah. Duty free. 
Yeah. Customs. Could you imagine the conversation if we, and I want to do this again. Um, think about all the endorsement deals that are in this world, right? Let's think about Phil Knight and Michael Jordan when he was coming out of Chapel Hill and how many pairs of shoes have been sold. The Bo Jacksons, the athletes, the Peyton Mannings and Papa John's and Shaquille O'Neal is selling like the general insurance. I mean, a lot of mm -hmm. endorsement deals, Brad Paisley's on these Peyton Manning commercials. There's, there's a lot of endorsement deals with celebrity because they have influence. They have the ability to reach an audience. They might do it with a Eric Church drinking a bottle on stage or a banner it might be um michael jordan playing in the N nba championships in the finals with his air jordans on in that nike swoop tiger woods one of the biggest endorsed athletes ever that nike ball rolling in the hole before they quit making nike golf gear but his shirts his hats his clothes i mean endorsement is huge and when i think about jack daniels and i don't know um this for sure but i don't think y'all pay many celebrities to endorse it but they all do i i can't imagine how many songs i want to do a google research because i haven't but i bet you there's over a, i bet you there's triple digit songs written about jack daniels eric church has a song called jack daniels david allen co jack daniels if you please knock me <laughs> to my knees like it's that was that song's in the 70s or early 80s this is been an endorse they endorse it for free because of what we talked about in the beginning of this this conversation of like that shirt that bandana people wear it tattoos the most it, the most branded tattoo there is think about all of these people are literally doing this because of the pride they take in the taste the recipe and the culture of that brand the quality of that brand it's it blows my mind like that's the as we sit here and sip on jack daniels and i have this ability and this this humbling experience to sit down with you with what you've achieved with jack daniels like that's what i think of is like how do you not want to be a part of this brand? And is you you probably hear it all the time. I know what's on the horizon. I know it's getting ready to happen in in cinema and the new commercials are awesome. But this whole thing about songs, Justin Moore has a song about Jack Daniels. Every country music singer, Chase Rice, they've all sang about Jack Daniels. What's going yeah. on? I mean, think about the conversation to be had just on these celebrities endorsing this brand on their own well you know and i think you know sometimes you have a, a singer who actually has written the song um but but often you know you have a talented pool of songwriters uh, who are bringing song True. options to to the singers to sing and they'll end up picking up one that they can somehow relate to uh, that you know that they think people enjoy listening to that'll get on radio and you know move up the charts for them so I think, you know, you have to look almost beyond the artist sometimes uh, to the songwriters. And, you know, I've, I've met quite a few of them uh, over the years. And uh, we've had some singer-songwriter events here. And I've become pretty good friends with Kyle Jacobs, who's married to Kelly Pickler. And, and he's a very talented uh, songwriter in country music in Nashville. And, you know, he, he was kind of giving me some insights about what it was like to be a songwriter. And, you know, my, my assumption was always that, you know, somebody was driving down the road and, you know, a bolt of lightning struck them and they, you know, had an idea and they wrote it down on a napkin and that became the song and then they, you know, went and sold it and it became a number one. But that is not how most songs come into being. They they take people who, you know, who, who write songs and are good at writing songs and they'll pair them up uh, with people that they don't always know. They'll, they'll be strangers to them. So they'll send them away and, you know, ask them to do these retreats where they just get to know one another. So these, then these retreats typically involve, you know, they'll take some alcohol along the bar where people can have a drink, not to, you know, be, uh, and just to kind of loosen them up a little bit, just social, you know, type drinking. And uh, he was telling me, he said, you know, I've never been on a singer songwriter uh, retreat that there wasn't Jack Daniels there. And he said, and it's not always what you start with, but inevitably it's what you're going to go to. And I said, why do you think that is? And he said, because when the Jack Daniels comes out, so does the truth. He said, you know, when these, these people get together and they're strangers, you know, you kind of are in that polite phase. You don't really want to say much about yourself. You don't get vulnerable. Uh, you don't get edgy, you know. But he said, you know, once the Jack Daniels is out, that's where the really – the, the gritty songs, the ones that really cut to the, the, the quick, if you will, uh, start to come out. And I think sometimes that, that means that Jack Daniels gets included in the lyrics too uh, because it was sort of how, you know, people just got honest with one another – where they found that real place where they wrote a song that told the story that people are going to hear and, and, and relate to. 
And to me, that's to me, that's what country music is. And not all country music tells a story. You know, sometimes it's just it's just, you know, it's got a good beat. You can dance to it. So I think there's some country that borders on pop. Uh, but the best, you know, classic country songs are ones that tell a story. And uh, preach you know, it, Mr. Jeff, preach it. I love this. Yeah. It, and, you know, the ones that the, the ones that become true classics, the ones that just are timeless, that you go back to, you know, he stopped loving her today. You know, it's, that's a story there uh, of heartache and of pain and, and all of that. But it's, you know, it's as if you've ever been through it, <laughs> um, um, you know, you, you, you hear it and you feel it. So, you know, and, and I, so I love country music. Um, my grandfather was a big music lover. He was friends with Carl Perkins. Uh, who was from Jackson where I grew up. So that rockabilly sound that kind of married rock with country was formed where I grew up. And, uh, but, you know, I've, I've had the had the privilege through Jack Daniels um, to meet a lot of great country music artists. And to your point, a lot of them are fans of Jack Daniels. And uh, we've, we've kind of had a philosophy here that it's sometimes hard to choose one uh, because if you choose one, you, you upset the others. And, and our philosophy at Jack Daniels is that we just, we want to be a friend to everybody. Um, so if an artist comes out on stage and they're singing about Jack Daniels or they've got a Jack Daniels t-shirt on, we'll reach out to them. I've written a lot of handwritten letters to them saying, thank you so much for being a fan of Jack Daniels. I would love to have you here at the distillery sometime to show you around. We'll send them a swag, you know, thing with bottles and shirts and, and things like that, just to let them know we acknowledge it and that we're very appreciative of it. Uh, and then in, in just in a few cases, has it escalated to more than that? Like, you know, Frank Sinatra would be in the first big uh, celebrity endorsement. All right, take. let's talk. Let's talk about that. That's that. That's how yeah. I was going to end this of your knowledge okay. of Frank and, and yeah. meeting his family. Um, the Rat Pack, Joey Bishop, Sammy Davis, Jr., Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, um, Vegas, the Strip. Frank Sinatra was not paid by Jack Daniels to do what he was doing. He was, he became like a natural organic spokesperson because of his belief and love of the product. Is this correct? It was, you know, we didn't really know, I guess uh, Frank Sinatra had been a fan of Jack Daniels for quite a few years, but he took that, you know, love of the brand public in 1955 uh, that was when he first held it up on stage and said, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jack Daniels and it's the nectar of the gods. The nectar of the gods. So that was how he referred to it. Um, and then our first salesperson, his name was Angelo Lucchese, um, after that, you know, was said, you know, followed up with Frank and said, you know, thank you so much for that. We really appreciate it. And uh, he took he took Jack Daniels from being a small regional whiskey brand into being a household name. And um, our sales doubled from 1955 to 1956. Uh, and largely the only thing that happened significantly in that time period was Frank's endorsement. So it just, it, it created a, a worldwide shortage for Jack Daniels. We were on allocation uh, for the next 25 years. So we could not make enough uh, whiskey here in Lynchburg from 1955 until about 1980. That was when we finally were able to catch up. So Frank created a shortage and, and our gift back to him was that even when it was impossible to find it, it was always there for him. So wherever he was going backstage, he was throwing parties, if he was going to restaurants, we would send the product ahead of him uh, and just as a thank you uh, for that endorsement. But he was a lifelong Jack Daniels drinker. He, he told Angelo that he had never heard of Jack Daniels, but he walked into a bar in 1947 and Jackie Gleason was in there and Jackie kind of motioned to him to come over and they sat down and I guess Frank, you know, he had, he kind of went in and out of a lot of relationships, had a lot of breakups and things. And he was a little bit down on this luck. I think he had just recently broken up with one of his ladies. Uh, and, but, but Frank just said, you look like a man that could use a Jack Daniels. And he had, he said, never heard of it before. Uh, but wow. between, between the two of them that night, they shared a bottle. I think pretty well finished it off, but he became a, a lifelong Jack Daniels drinker up to the point that when he died, they actually put a bottle of Jack Daniels in his casket before they closed it. So okay, so with that be with that being to the grave, with him. To the grave. he t he takes the nectar of the gods to the <laughs> grave with him. I mean, it's yeah. just like so. What yeah. is the significance of this of this recipe or this aging or what when you get your hands on a bottle of Sinatra now? 
Yeah. I have one. I will not let anybody touch it. If they look at it funny, I kind of get that little kind of glimmer of Mike Tyson in my eye. Like, don't even think about it kind of deal. Is it a collector's item? Should you open it? Is it taste different than what we just sipped on here and tasted here? What What's going on with the Sinatra's collection? You know, it, it does taste different because it has a different, what I describe as batch architecture. Um, if you look at the whiskey that Frank would have held up from Jack Daniels back in the 50s, you know, in general, all all American whiskeys, whether they be Kentucky bourbons or Tennessee whiskeys, just uh, 90 proof was the standard. They tended to be pretty dark and oaky uh, as a general rule, uh, maybe more so than they are even today. So, you know, in talking with Frank had already passed away uh, when we started to talk about doing the Sinatra select version of Jack Daniels. So we were dealing with his children at the time. Um, but the words that they kept using uh, to describe their dad and what they thought would should be a central point of the of the whiskey was the words bold and smooth. They said, you know, that was those would be two words that would describe dad pretty well. Um, you know, he made you know bold choices. Uh, you know, it, it, like I said, when he was going bald, he put on a fedora hat and everybody started wearing a hat, even if they had a head full of hair. So he turned a, you know, a balding head into a fashion statement. So people kind of followed him. You know, a lot of people were scared of him uh, because, you know, he was pretty well connected and had a lot of power. And, uh, you know, he was the chairman of the board and he was the most powerful guy in the room. And uh, he had a lot of things going for him. Uh, but uh, he had that smooth crooner's voice that so many people tried to mimic. And um, so as much as he had an edge, he also had a polish about him. So, you know, in talking with his children, it was like, we want a whiskey that speaks to that. You know, it's, so we were thinking it should be dark. It should be 90 proof because that would be more reminiscent of the 50s when he called it the nectar of the gods. But uh, we're not just a whiskey maker, but we're a barrel maker, too. Uh, so we have proprietary technologies that we work into the barrels. But we had toasted, charred and then also grooved uh, the inside of some barrels, which doubles the inside surface area you know, of the barrel and sort of changes the whole kinetics of, of ferment or the maturation process by doing that. Also, the loose material you remove stays in there, so it's almost like concentrated or putting wood chips into the barrel. But watching those barrels mature, uh, they were 40% darker than barrels that we didn't do that to. So we knew that going in and creating this, what we call the Sinatra barrel, was going to be a little bit of a game changer from a character standpoint. Definitely bold. Definitely bold. That's Those barrels have a boldness that we don't see in other barrels. So when they said bold and smooth, we were like, you know, we've got bold. You know, we've, we've actually got these barrels. We had not, we hadn't decided what we were going to do with them, but it just became a natural play uh, to, to do what his children had wanted to do and to make a, a really different and great whiskey. So it's 90 proof, uh, groove barrel, dark, a little bit longer finish. Uh, but I, I have some people who've told me that they were never really a fan of Jack Daniels, that there was just something about it they didn't particularly care for, but they tried the Sinatra and it's just, it's, it's fantastic. So it's that different. Do so, you like it? I do. Oh, I absolutely do. Um, you know, it's one of the more expensive things in our lineup. So I think for most people, they wouldn't see it as uh, as necessarily being their everyday drinking whiskey. But it, but it clearly, it's a it's a wonderful one for special occasions. You know, if you're just going to do a splurge and and spoil yourself, or you have some you know something you want to celebrate. The Sinatra Select is a great whiskey to do it with. It's certainly, it's certainly befitting that. Um, so, and, and it's one of those, you said, you know, you're asking me if you should open it and drink it. You can, because it's still available. It's you know, still it's available. Like, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's an ongoing offering from us. So sometimes I'll tell people, you'll want to really think you know, long and hard about when you open a bottle because we don't make it anymore. Uh, but in the case of the Sinatra Select, it's still available in most markets, or it can be ordered uh, into a store. If you don't find it in a store, if you'll ask for it, they typically can get it. So it's, it is one of the more limited things that we do. Uh, but it's available. Do you enjoy it? I do. I enjoy pretty much every version of Jack Daniels. You know, I was I was a Tennessee Squire. Uh, I was a fan of the brand before I got here. Uh, I had tried to pretty much, I, I, I was not a big fan of Scotch whiskeys when I tried them. The Smoke and Pete just didn't really do it for me. Um, I had a, uh, my roommate in college uh, was more of a, of a whiskey drinker, bourbon drinker than I was. He He's the one who, introduced me to it uh, when I was in college and it was with him just sitting there talking with him, you know, trying to figure out the meaning of life. 
uh, that I developed my whiskey palate and love of it. But that was when I discovered Jack Daniels too, uh, that I noticed that, you know, it was kind of convenient. I'm a native Tennessean uh, and Jack Daniels is probably the best known product that, that's manufactured and shipped out of the state of Tennessee. I think most people think of Tennessee and they think of music and whiskey. Uh, that's sort 100%. of the two, the two things that, that Tennessee is most known for. And, and that whiskey reputation has been pretty well solely created by Jack Daniels. What, um, I literally, I've been doing podcasting for two and a half years and like, I just looked up, we've been on this podcast almost two and a half hours. Like that's a good thing, but (laughs) we haven't even, we have, we've scratched the surface, I guess, kinda, but I just kind of, I have like questions of does Jack get influenced by other liquor brands to come out with a certain deal or has these ideas have always been there. Now I'm going to ask you this and if you want me to cut it out, I can, because I don't know how you feel about this as the master distiller, but you are an open book. Fireball comes onto the market. I don't know the history of it, but it kind of just takes over. It's like the shot to have for party goers, bars across America, nightclubs, whatever. Jack, a few years later, comes out with Jack Tennessee Fire, absolutely blows the doors off of Fireball and taste and overall smoothness. In my opinion, is it meant to compete with a fireball because of the success of fireball or what was the, th- the th- what was the thinking behind Tennessee fire? You know, I would say absolutely, you know, is, is Jack Daniels and what we offer shaped by what's going on out in the marketplace? Without a doubt it is. Uh, it's not that we're willing to change the process uh, per se, uh, but we're willing to offer new products if we think that they are what people want. Uh, so when I became master distiller, only three products. I mean, the, the, the uh, Jack Daniels brand was 140 something years old and we only had come out with three products up to that point. So now we've gone to 11. So, you know, we've almost tripled, uh, quadrupled the size of the portfolio of Jack Daniels. And that's not necessarily because I was so itching and, and anxious to want to put my fingerprints all over the brand and come out with a lot of new products. But It really is more about what's going on out in the marketplace. And that is you've got more people exploring the whiskey space than ever before. Uh, The the nature of of whiskey uh, exploration is that people are wanting to try new things. Uh, So, you know, that's what we're offering them from Jack Daniels. But uh, this, the category of American whiskey was pretty sleepy for quite a while. Uh, There was about a three decade period where it was just very, you know, Jack Daniels grew through that time frame, largely because we were beginning to sell outside the U.S., but most brands were just very stagnant uh, to, to slightly declining uh, in size. So it's just there's been this whole whiskey renaissance that started about ten years ago, and glad to say a lot of it had to do with women. You know, women no longer accepting the fact that whiskey was just a man's drink, and and a lot of women there's all kinds of women's bourbon clubs now. So they're they're the big difference in why you know, brown spirits have taken off the way they have is that women are, are drinking it more than they ever have before. But clearly I think the, uh, the millennials, uh, women, there's just been a movement back towards things that are higher in flavor. It happened in beer maybe a few years before it did in whiskey, but you know, a lot of people went away from the big beer brands and started to go for the IPAs and the, and the smaller craft beers because they were a little bit more interesting and more flavorful. So You've seen this generational choices where people will go to softer, lighter drinks. We saw it in spirits that, you know, whiskey was really hot for about three decades. And then vodka kind of took over for three decades. And now whiskey's back up again. And and if anything, the vodka's kind of going down that people are more uh, in the whiskey space. And if if I'm going to drink something, it would be nice if it had some character about it. So we're, we're optimistic that that's going to be a good run for whiskey, that the last time this happened, it was not just a single decade. It was three decades wow. uh, that, that it was on a tear. So we're prepared for that. We certainly hope so. But so we've got other whiskeys to come. We've come out with eight new items uh, just in the last seven or eight years, and we've got a few to come. So if people are wanting to explore new and exciting and different things. And, you know, that seems to be the nature of what draws interest. But it'll never replace the fact that our old number seven Tennessee whiskey is the most important thing that we do here. Um, it's, and we're not changing it. So, you know, we're not willing to kind of, to change that, uh, to, to public pressure per se, that, 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 that recipe, that process, uh, it is, we're, we're so confident in it. It's, it is the sacred cow uh, of what Jack Daniels is. Uh, but if we can make some new and exciting things that cast a bigger net 
in the marketplace that bring more people to Jack Daniels, uh, then that's a good thing too. That's why we made rye. That's why we've done flavors. Uh, those, I think both of those answer maybe some of the complaints that certain people had about why they didn't drink Jack Daniels. Uh, the, the people who said that they don't drink Jack Daniels, you know, five or 10 years ago, I'm like, you need to come back and take a look again because there's more to consider now uh, than you had back then. Wow. It's a, it's amazing to think that, you know, like the, the consistency and, and to hear you say it went down three decades to me, I would have never guessed it. I just would think that Jack Daniels never really lost its place in the American culture. Um, but I, again, I, I, I'm not, I'm not one to, you know, argue that it just seems that if there was a go-to, it was going to be Jack, it was going to be there for you. And it maybe, well, yeah. maybe go ahead. Yeah. Let, let me, let me just kind of, I'll correct that. The 50s, 60s and 70s were great for all, all whiskey companies. That was when whiskey was king, whiskey cocktails, the mad men era uh, of, of time in this country. So most of your American whiskeys did really well through the 50s, 60s and 70s, but the U.S. business went soft uh, in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. So Jack Daniels still did well. We continued to grow, but you know that was about the time that we were catching up from the the shortage that Frank Sinatra had created. We had, we could not make enough from 55 to 1980. So when the U.S. business got to be a, you know where it wasn't growing quite as fast, it just kind of stagnated, went more stationary. That was when we finally had enough whiskey to open up markets outside the U.S. So today we actually sell more Jack Daniels outside the U.S. than we do in. Uh, so that's how we grew, and that's how we became, uh, you know, more of a, a symbol mm -hmm. of America, American icon because we went from being in just one country to now being in 170 countries around the world. Uh, but it was it wasn't until the early 80s that we were in a position to even offer product outside the U.S. So we went to the U.K., went to South Africa, went to, you know, to Japan. We went to markets that were doing well with Scotch whiskey, uh, and and basically through our brand, you know, hat in the ring. Uh, into the world stage and it's done very well there it's amazing well I, I, I visit italy and we they have what they call whiskey bars in italy and mm -hmm. i have a friend over there named marco Domenici. i said well what's the favorite he says jack daniels like they that's what they, <laughs> they love it in italy you know it's like that's what they what they drink but jeff arnett hot seat i know that you <laughs> stated earlier that it depends on your mood what you're going to choose. You're going to watch the Super Bowl, and you ha all these are Jack Daniels drinks. You can't go for a cold beer. Super Bowl adrenaline's going. Tennessee Titans are playing in it. What are you drinking? What Jack are you having on that kind of atmosphere? Probably our old number seven Tennessee whiskey on the rocks. Wow. Okay. What about the tried what about and true backyard barbecue uh, on a Sunday before you start your week and you're with your wife and two other couples that are good family friends? Probably going to Gentleman Jack. Gentleman Jack with barbecue. Well, I'm, I'm going to Gentleman Jack because my wife and friends are there. And to me, Gentleman Jack is the most friendly, uh, most approachable and not knowing when you have friends over, some of them drink whiskey and some of them don't. Uh, but I, what I have found is that Gentleman Jack is something almost anyone can drink, even if they're not normally a whiskey drinker. Uh, I enjoy it, uh, but it's my wife's favorite, and it's going to be approachable for our guests. Eric Church is playing a pop-up concert on Broadway in Nashville, Tennessee. You're there with your, a bunch of friends. <laughs> it's time to get a little bit rowdy. What, Jack, do you have watching Eric Church rock the stage? You know, with, with Eric, it's got to be single barrel. It's got to be what we picked today. It's a, you know, that's Eric's uh, go-to call. He's uh, he's picked so many single barrels here uh, over the years. So I know what's in his glass when he holds it up high on stage. Uh, so I'm going to match him uh, with something equally nice. Uh, but I'm going to go single barrel uh, for Eric. If you had to pick your favorite song about Jack Daniels, do you got one off the top of your head? Go. You know, I, I think I probably would go with Eric's uh, Jack Daniels song. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and I do. I think it's... Um, it's, it's, it's kind of clever, uh, the, the, you know, that every Superman has a script tonight. Um, and, and, you know, basically say that, you know, Jack Daniels <laughs> roughed him up pretty hard, but he's going to go ahead and do it again. <laughs> he's still going to get back in <laughs> yeah. the ring. Yeah. Yeah. For real. I lost the you fight. You can't quit. I'm coming back for another round. It's that logo and that brand and that bottle. You're like, I'm back. I'm, I'm here. It is. But you know, the, the, also the, Jack Daniels, if you please, that's got to be one of the old oh, Jack Daniels. I love Co. That used to be my, be my ringtone on my, <laughs> my phone. Uh, so that was 
Because it's because the song starts there. I mean, it's like the first words. It's not like you have to wait to hear Jack Daniels. It's like the Jack first, Daniels. First, if you oh, David Coe just owns it's the it. lead. If you have yeah. to drink a Jack and Coke or a Jack and Diet Coke because you're watching your calories or your sugar, maybe mm -hmm. where do you do that at? Um, you know, I, I don't drink a whole lot of, but I, um, I, my very first drink of Jack Daniels was a Jack and Coke. You know, so to me, it's very nostalgic. Uh, it kind of I, I can almost have one of those and reminisce thinking about the first time I ever had it. Like I said, it was when I was in college, a friend of mine introduced me to it. And uh, I didn't know all the different cocktails that you can make with a whiskey, but I had heard of a Jack and Coke before. So I went and did one. And I'm like, that was pretty good. Delicious. It, it's, it's kind of interesting because I think I've told people, I said, I think my very first Jack and Coke was like, it was like Jack and Coke, you know, <laughs> as far as the proportions, it was like, you know, one part Jack and eight or 10 parts Coke. And I, you know, now it's like, Jack and Coke. It's almost like <laughs> Which just is good. enough Coke. Yeah, it's, just enough Coke. To, it's like to a kind press kind. It's just like a press. Yeah, just to, just a color, just to kind of throw people off. Yeah, just throw people off. I don't know what's in the glass, but yeah, so the proportions have changed over time, but I still like a Jack and Coke. And, you know, you were talking about that earlier. You know, I'll occasionally, I will drink a Pepsi, but it's not going to go in a, in a glass of Jack. You know, it's just, there's something magical about Coke and, and Jack Daniels. Oh, to get man. Really, and and, and I, there, there's other types of soft drinks that I like. But there's only one uh, that that is suitable to go into uh, Jack Daniel's whiskey, and it's Coke. There's just something magical about it. Last question for the hot seat: Jeff Arnett, Master Distiller, Jack Daniel's, Lynchburg, Tennessee. You walk out of your office right now after this conversation with yours truly. You walk in to to track three. You see somebody stirring a pot of mash. You don't know who it is. You get closer. <laughs> it's Jack Daniel's. He's back. Yeah. What do you say? What do you say to the man <laughs> that's given you your livelihood and the, the, ha, that you take so much pride and passion in? What do you say to Jack Daniels? There is, there's, there's really one question that people have asked me in the past uh, that only Jack Daniel could answer. Um, and that is when it came to the mellowing process, why did you choose hard sugar maple wood? Um, what, were there other woods you considered? for it and why ultimately did you choose that one and and i think i have some insight but what i really want to know is am i right <laughs> <You know? laughs> I've, I've been asked that question before and i've come up with my own practical reasons why i think he chose what he chose but i just would love to know jack am i right am i even close uh to the the, the reason of why you did it you know I, it's a beautiful wood it's indigenous here it, it's very low ash you know jack was religious about wanting to not just use charcoal but to change the charcoal out and uh there's hardwood there's certain hardwoods that generate a lot of ash when you burn them into charcoal if you've ever burned hardwoods to, to heat a home you know there are certain hardwoods that every night you burn it just trashes the fireplace there's so many ashes in there you're having a scoop in buckets and haul them away and then there are certain types of wood that you can burn and you can burn for days before you have enough ashes to need to scoop them out and 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 maple is sort of like the latter wood that I'm describing there. It just burns so clean. Uh, it doesn't generate a lot of ash. And I think that would have been important if he was changing the charcoal out all the time. Uh, that way it didn't put an ash stream into the distillate going into the barrel. So it just kept the, it just, it, the, the whiskey uh, flows clear through it almost immediately, uh, even when we're changing out a brand new vat. So that's just, it's, it's superior in that regard. So but, you would ask him a question about his technique. You would actually, would. you would test the man. I would, I, you know, that's, that's cool. Like I, said, I, I feel like I'm the steward of the brand now uh, and I'm not, and I'm not challenging any of those decisions that Jack made. We're just, we're, like I said, we're, we're trying to make some new whiskeys, uh, but I'm trying to stay uh, true to the ones that were started here years ago. Uh, just keep them as consistent as I can. Uh, just make sure we don't disappoint people. People who are fans of our old number seven Tennessee whiskey, don't disappoint them. Don't try to change it. Put your fingerprints on it. Um, if there are people who don't like that whiskey, show them that Jack Daniels can be more than that if they need it to be. And make make rye, make make flavors, do things like that. Uh, so hopefully Jack would approve of those types of choices too. Uh, right. To ask him, maybe that would be another good question: Is are you okay with decisions that have been made since she passed? You know, oh, that'd you, be cool. Are you still proud that your name is on this bottle? Uh, I would certainly hope so. We are. The people How could he not be? Uh, that, that, you know, it carries his name and, and hopefully, you know, he's smiling down on us now and saying we've done him proud that every day we've made it, we've made it the best we could. That's what he asked us to do. And that's what we're doing. 
My uncle always told me, Mr. Jeff Arnett, that he knows the man so well that he calls him John. I'm sure you've heard that before. And <laughs> do you yeah, call son of a woman? <laughs> son of a woman. Al Pacino. Yeah, case, Al of, case of John Daniels. Yeah, case of John Daniels. My uncle Lavore <laughs> is an old cowboy. He says that too. But uh, yeah. Um, I don't know, man. This has been awesome. I, do you have all the information you need for me for the barrel to get to the to the you know to get it coming? I do. Okay. I've, I've got all the information here on the bottles that we're sharing. Like I said, I've got the same set of bottles that you do. Uh, so I'll go ahead and get that barrel released to you. Uh, we'll get some artwork from you, whatever it is you want. Yeah, to Tommy's have. got it. Tommy's got okay. it. Okay. He's already uh, designed the medallion. Yep. We'll, we'll take a look at how big the barrel is and how many medallions you need. We'll make sure we get those ordered and get them hung on the bottles. And then we'll be looking for the next truck headed your way. Man, this has been a pleasure. I'm humbled. I, I, a couple of things. I'd really like to do this again because I have so much more um, just curiosity of the brand because it means so much to me to be involved with it. I'm humbled by it. And also, um, I want to share Duck Camp this year. Come out and, and, and hang around a fire, tell stories like this, and just become better friends. I think that it's a, Duck Camp's the best place to become friends with somebody. Hunting camp is, yeah, as a whole in general. But, man, I appreciate it. I look forward to meeting you in person, and I'm truly humbled to be part of the jack brand well thank you it's been a pleasure to be with you today and i know if you like to hunt ducks you probably wouldn't mind hunting a turkey every now and then uh, that's what we really have here yeah uh, we have tur wild turkeys running the property we don't allow people to hunt the property uh but it probably needs to be hunted there, it's but there's real. a lot of the landowners that supply uh, you with the ingredients yeah. that have turkeys on their land well you know they're, they're part of the sanitation here because when the grain trucks unload a lot of times they'll spill it on the ground so the turkeys just they'll come and clean up behind the truck so oh, i want to hunt there <laughs> yeah if the, if the turkeys don't eat it then it's going to draw you know rodents and things in yeah. so part of your your quality control they, they'll clean up anything that spills overnight but it's funny because the, the turkeys they they learn your truck schedule we don't deliver trucks into the distillery all day long. We have, you know, there's a time when, especially when we're doing tours here, we try not to bring a lot of trucks on because they have to turn around and weigh in. And it's in an area that a lot of tourists walk through. We don't want them to get, you know, taking selfies or whatever, get hit by a truck. You know, it's, if you run over a tourist, that's not very good for tourism, I think. No, uh, I don't think so. But, you know, the turkeys will learn the truck schedule. So they tend to go up into the hills above the distillery uh, during the day when the tours are here. And then later in the day, when the sun starts to set, you'll see them start working their way down. The trucks are rolling in, and they are they are big. They're big grain fed turkeys. <laughs> really good eating. Oh my gosh, yeah, they're huge. Well, we've talked. Casey and I have talked about doing a foul life giveaway. Mm -hmm. um, I got another person that I want to do it with in the industry, but doing a Lynchburg turkey hunt in the spring of 2021 with a concert at barbecue hill i want to have another one of these to talk about barbecue hill and we've talked about you know we're, we're coming up with some ideas and initiatives and plans to bring some activity there and some some different events so after covid gets out hopefully sooner than later we can all hey, get together I'm, I'm looking forward to that for more reasons than one uh, yes, but it'll, sir. it'll be great to have you here I'm i can't forward. wait man okay all right I'm, I'm a huge fan of what you do. Thank you so much yeah. for your time. Yeah. I will look forward to getting the barrel. I got your cell number. I'll text you and yeah. um, and stay in touch when I get the, the, the bottles, and I'll let you know how that's yeah. going. All right. You take care. Stay safe. That's Jeff Arnett, master distiller of Jack Daniels Lynchburg, Tennessee, the most iconic brand, in my opinion, in American history. Enjoy it responsibly. Never allow underage drinking. Make sure that you're there with Jack with everything that you need, the breakups, the fun, the laughs, the concerts, the good times, the campfires, the duck camps. But again, enjoy it responsibly. This episode of This Life Ain't For Everybody podcast was brought to you by our friends at Jack Daniels, Lynchburg, Tennessee. Thank you all so much for joining myself and Jeff Arnett, master distiller there at Jack Daniels. We'll be back with another episode. Tom, hit that button. This is my good friend, Leith Lofton, singing a song called what you gonna do when the money's all gone y'all take care i'd rather be poor living off in a hole richest hill without soul life on earth